This is Josiah Plays Lone Wolf Book 8 The Jungle of Horrors You are Lone Wolf, the last Kai Master of Somerland, sworn avenger of your forefathers, the Kai Lords. To achieve your vow, you must find the lore stone of Orido, known to be hidden in the jungle swamps of the Danarg. Guided by Lord Pido, warrior magician of Desi, you set off across the war-torn lands of Telestria on your vital secret mission. But your quest is soon endangered when your identity is discovered by agents of your mortal enemies, the Dark Lords of Helgadad. Can you survive the assassins of Nog, the armies of Warlord Zegrun, and the chaos creatures of Agarash the Damned? Will you fall foul of their fall? Will you fall foul of their evil schemes, or will you defeat them and fulfill your destiny? We'll find out in this book, Book Eight: The Jungle of Horrors. This is one of the Lone Wolf books, written in the early '80s slash early '90s by Joe Deaver and illustrated by Gary Chalk. I read and played these books when I was a little kid, and I love them. Now I'm revisiting them. The music you hear throughout this stream slash video is all by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. You'll find links to his site uh, down below in the video description on YouTube. So... You can see the cover art there. That's the original American publication of the book. It was published prior to that in, in the United Kingdom, as all of these books were, and had different covers there. But when they published it in the U.S., this is what the original cover looked like. I owned this book, the physical book. This is the cover of the one that I owned. And uh, it's an interesting cover. It's very action-packed, but... It's really not my favorite at all. I, I don't like it that much. I don't like the way Lone Wolf looks on this cover. It looks kind of strange to me. The Somersword, the Somersword is there, and that's cool. And there's a snake, which of course I have to like that, because I'm partial to snakes, but... I don't know. Something about this cover just seems weird to me. It doesn't look that jungly. And there's something about that creature coming up out of the water that I just... I don't know, it's kind of dodgy. But, uh, good times anyway. This is a Magna Kai adventure, the third one. Eighth book of the series overall, third part of the Magna Kai section of the series. And, uh, let's go ahead and move on through this. We've got some dedications and acknowledgements and all that good stuff. And then we come to the story so far. Previously on Lone Wolf. You are the warrior, Lone Wolf, last of the Kai Masters of Somerland, and sole survivor of the massacre that destroyed your kinsmen during a bitter war with your age-old enemies, the Dark Lords of Helgadad. Many centuries have passed since Sun Eagle, the first of your kind, established the Order of the Kai. Aided by the magicians of Desi, he completed a perilous quest to find seven crystals of power, known as the Lore Stones of Nixator. On discovering them, he unlocked a wisdom and strength that lay within both the Lore Stones and himself. He recorded the nature of his discoveries and experiences in a great tome entitled The Book of the Magna Kai. You have discovered this lost Kai treasure and have given a solemn pledge to restore the Kai to their former glory ensuring the security of your land in the years to come. However, your diligent study of this ancient book has enabled you to master only three of the ten Magna Kai disciplines. To fulfill your pledge, you must complete the quest, first undertaken by Sun Eagle over 1,000 years ago, and find the lore stones of Nixator. By doing so, you, too, will acquire the power and wisdom of the Magna Kai, which is held within the Lorestone's crystal forms. 
Already your quest has taken you far from your northern homeland. Follow me in the footsteps of the first Kai Grand Master. You journeyed to Desi and sought the help of the Elder Magi, the magicians who aided Sun Eagle on his quest long ago. There you learned that one of the seven lore stones was still present in their land, hidden deep within the island stronghold known as Kazan Ud, Castle Death. In the years since Sun Eagle first came to Desi, the fortress of Kazan Ud had become the abode of a great but evil sorcerer called Zada. The Elder Magi, realizing the danger of Zada's increasing power, attempted to destroy Kazan Ud, but they failed. In desperation, they constructed a prison of energy around the fortress to prevent Zada from ever escaping. Steadily, however, his power grew, and the people of Desi lived in fear of the day when he would break free and wreak his vengeance upon them. When you resolved to enter Kazan Ud to retrieve the Lore Stone, the Elder Magi rejoiced, for the success of your quest would bring about the destruction of Zada and put an end to the bane that had haunted Desi for hundreds of years. You survived the perils of Castle Death and emerged triumphant, achieving that which the Elder Magi had believed to be impossible. During the victory celebrations held in your honor, you learned that for centuries the Elder Magi had been expecting your coming. An ancient Desi legend tells of the birth and rise to greatness of two Kuratazkai, Sons of the Sun. One was named Ikar, which means eagle. The other was named Skarn, which means wolf. A prophecy foretold that the Kuratazkai would come from the north to seek the counsel of the Elder Magi in order that they might fulfill a great quest. Although separated by several centuries, they would share one spirit, one purpose, and one destiny to triumph over the Champions of Darkness in an age of great peril. At the Temple of Truth in Elzion, the magnificent capital city of Desi, the Elder Magi prepared you for the next stage of the Magna Kai quest. Lord Ramoa, the Speaker of the High Council, tutored you in the ancient histories of Magnamund, and you received lessons in lore that you would have learned from the Kai Masters if only they had survived the attack by the murderous Dark Lords of Helgadad. The lore stone you must find now lies hidden in a temple in the center of a jungle swamp known as the Danarg. In ancient times, this huge area, once the crater of a massive volcano, was controlled by a powerful lord of evil called Agarash the Damned. The Elder Magi defeated him in a war that lasted 1,000 years, and, in the wake of his destruction, they turned the Danarg Crater into a rich and fertile paradise, the perfect setting for their most sacred place of worship, the Temple of Orido. The Danarg flourished until a great plague befell the Elder Magi and decimated their race. They were forced to abandon the Danarg and seek refuge in Desi. Slowly, the Danarg was consumed by a creeping mire, which swallowed or poisoned all healthy forms of life. The crater became a sanctuary for a host of evil creatures who thrived in the fetid waters and fought for control of the treacherous shifting mudflats. Many came from the barren hills of Ogia, but many more awoke from lairs deep within the crater where they had lain dormant since the defeat of their master, Agarash the Damned, 8,000 years ago. Now the time for study has passed, and the time for swift action has arrived. Grim news from the West prompts the Elder Magi to cease their counseling and arrange for your immediate passage to the, to the Denarg. In the Dark Lord city of Helgadad, a civil war has raged for five years following your defeat of Hakan, Archlord of the Black City. Now a new lord sits upon the throne of Helgadad, Dark Lord Nog of Mosgoar. The Dark Lords are united behind their new leader, reports Lord Ramoa solemnly to his fellow elders of the High Council. And they are hungry for conquest and revenge. Their strength grows with each passing day. We dare delay no longer. Silently, the members of the High Council rise from their seats and turn to face you. No sounds reach your ears. 
yet the words of their blessing fill your mind. May the gods Ishir and Kai protect you on your journey into darkness, Kor Skarn, they intone. Alright, so serious stuff going on. We can afford to delay no longer. Sounds like we've got quite an adventure ahead of us. Hey, Hanson85, how you doing? Uh, I don't think I'm going to play any Arkham today. I played some yesterday. A couple hours of it. It's up on my YouTube channel. I, uh, I'm going to do this Lone Wolf book, and then I'm going to do Metro 20, or Metro Last Light. That's the plan at this point. If I keep streaming after Metro Last Light, it'll be Sunless Sea, but I don't know that I'll do that. We'll, we'll see what happens. But this and, this and Metro Last Light is all I'm, uh, all I'm sure I'm going to do today. So, we're moving through. The game rules are the same. We get another Magna Chi Discipline because we completed the last book. So, when uh, Pido's brother died in the cage because I couldn't cure him last book, I swore that I would take Curing as my next Discipline. So that is the one I'm going to take. Curing. The possessor of this skill can restore one lost endurance point to his total for every numbered section of the book through which he passes, provided he is not involved in combat. This Magna Chi discipline also enables a Chi Master to cure disease, blindness, and any combat wounds sustained by others as well as himself. Using the knowledge that mastery of this skill provides will also allow a Chi Master to identify the properties of any herbs, roots, and potions that may be encountered during the adventure. So I'm going to check this. Curing. That's my fifth Magna Chi Discipline. I don't complete any new lore circles because of that, but uh, now I can save people like I couldn't save Pido's brother. I move forward with great sadness knowing that my towel was lost at the end of the last book, and I am no longer carrying around a towel. Before leaving Desi on your journey to the Denarg, the Elder Magi give you a map of the Jungle Swamp. Let's check out the map, as we always do. Map looks pretty cool. Let's, let me send the cover away, the book cover, so that you can see the map. So it looks like this one's got a couple Giax on the side. I think they're Giax. And they're holding banners. One's got a upheld hand, and one's got a... Black Wolf Head. The Denarg Swamp, pretty cool. There's Ogia, Magador, Delden, Eldenora. Okay, so this area over here is where is is the west side, southwest part of the map that we were looking at when we were in book four? No, book six. The Kingdoms of Terror. In that book, so the area we were in that book would have been like over here. And this part of the map was just to the southwest, so this kind of connects up to that map that we were on that time. And there's uh, Telestria, there's the Denarg, it says it's unexplored. So that is our setting for this book. And they give me a pouch of gold. How much gold? I rolled a zero, and I add ten to that, which gives me ten. So, I'm going to take three of that, and I'm going to take the other seven and add it to my stash in the monastery. That I can get rid of now. I can also take five items from the list below, a sword, a bow, a quiver with six arrows. How am I doing on arrows? I have four, so let me take this quiver so I'll have six. Oh yeah, my backpack was lost, so I have a lot of inventory space all of a sudden. So I'll take a rope. I'll take a potion of Lomspur. Take a lantern. I'll take three meals. I don't need them because I have hunt mastery, but 
I'll take them anyway just because I can. So let's see, I took a quiver, a rope, a potion, a lantern, three meals. That's my five items. I've already got some fire seeds. So moving forward, everything we know, all of this is still the same. Combat rules have not changed. Levels of Magna Chi training. I am pleased to announce, or perhaps sad to announce, depending on how you look at it. We are no longer a primate. We have moved up in the world and we are now a tutelary. I'm now a tutelary. I'm an ex-primate. <laughs> no longer a primate, so there will be no more monkeying around. No more going ape shit. No more guerrilla warfare. Alright. So... We have no new lore circles, because we haven't taken the... If we took weapon mastery, we would complete the circle of fire, which I might do very which I might do in the next book, but I'm not sure. Improve disciplines. So, curing, we have this now and we've passed primate. Primates with this skill will have the ability to delay the effect of poisons, including venoms that they may come into contact with. Although a kai primate with this skill is not able to neutralize a poison, he will be able to slow its effect, giving him more time to find an antidote or cure. And then now that we're a tutelary, some of our disciplines have improved. We have invisibility. Tutelaries are able to increase the effectiveness of their skill by drawing the enemy's attention to a place other than that in which they are hiding. The effectiveness of this ability increases as a Kai Master rises in rank. So kind of a distract move. That's cool. We have Pathsmanship. Two Delirious with this skill can detect an enemy ambush within 500 yards of their position, unless their endurance score is low due to wounds sustained or lack of food. And we also have Divination. Two Delirious who possess this Magna Chi discipline are able to recognize objects or creatures with magical skills or abilities, although they may not be able to if the creature or object is shielded from detection. Cool, so our abilities are getting better as we rank up. The quest for the Lore Stone of Orido will be fraught with danger, for the temple in which it lies is situated deep within the Danarg. May the spirit of your ancestors guide you on the path of the Magna Chi. And we reach Section 1, the official beginning of the adventure. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm not quite ready. And now I am. Let's do this. You leave Elzian under cover of darkness on a trading ship bound for Garthen. It is a trim vessel, lean, proud, and simple in design. One of a thousand such ships that sail the chain of landlocked seas and lakes dividing the northern and southern continents of Magnamund. Its passage along this great waterway, called the Tentarius, is unlikely to invite undue attention, and it is for this reason that the Elder Magi have placed you aboard. The nature of your voyage is secret, but you are not alone, for a guide has been chosen to accompany you on your dangerous mission. His name is Pido, a tall, ebony-skinned Vaqueros, who is a master of the art of battle magic. We remember Pido from the, from the last book. And unfortunately, we let his brother die in a cage because we couldn't heal him. Among his fellow warriors, he is a high-ranking lord, respected and honored for his bravery and skill on the field of battle. Now, for the mission that lies ahead, he has exchanged his gold and scarlet robes for the clothes of a commoner, a roving adventurer with a sword for hire. It is a disguise you too have adopted to veil your true identity on the long voyage to the land of Telestria, where a rendezvous with royalty awaits you. You sail westwards, a benevolent wind filling the triangular sail and skimming the ship across the still blue waters. 
The hull seems to slide over the surface of the water rather than cut its way through, and you cannot help but wonder if Pido has conjured some magic to speed your passage. Your first port of call is the city of Talon, where food stocks and fresh water are replenished. Then the voyage continues along the Tentarius to the port of Orello, the last stopping place before your shipbound journey ends at Garthen, crown capital of Telestria. It is an hour past midnight when you dock at Varnos Harbor in Garthen, a sprawling network of keys and cracked stone jetties that shelter great fleets of merchants, traders, and dows. Silently like a shadow, you disembark and follow Pido through the twisting harbor streets, slowly climbing the steep stairs that connect one level of Garthen to the next. Rusty lanterns cast pools of yellow light beneath the timbered balconies, illuminating the stalls of merchants and vendors who will haggle, brag, and barter in the crowded streets till dawn. Pido halts at an iron shod door and wraps the grill with the hilt of his blue steel sword. A man's face appears, stern and handsome, with smooth dark hair and keen intelligent eyes. A smile of recognition softens his lordly features when he sees Pido. In an instant, the door swings open and you are ushered inside. The man's name is Adamas, Lord Constable of the Royal Citadel, protector and cousin of Queen Yvain of Telestria. For centuries, a strong bond of friendship has existed between the royal household and the magicians of Desi. And when called upon by the Elder Magi to help you in your quest, Queen Yvain pledged her support without hesitation. She has volunteered the services of Lord Adamas, who is to ensure your safe and unhindered passage through Telestria to the borders of the Danarg. At dawn, after snatching a few hours sleep, you are taken by coach to the East City Wharf, where an empty corn barge is waiting to ferry you upriver. Haulage is provided by eight large Gorkas, hairy, ox-like creatures from the plains of Slovia, which are harnessed to the barge by chains. They lumber along the cobbled towpath, continually kept in line by the stinging lash of the barge owner's Zolhide whip. The next day, the barge arrives at a small river village called Lona, where a detachment of Lord Adamas's cavalry, resplendent in surcoats of scarlet and gray, provides you with horses for the cross-country journey to the fortified city of Fina. Ill news greets you in Fina, the city of Triple Towers. Zegrin, warlord of Zanar, ruler of the barren highlands of Ogia, has amassed an army of Dracarum warriors. Three days ago, they attacked the border town of Lucos to the north. The Telestrian garrison put up a brave and spirited defense, but they were hopelessly outnumbered by the bloodthirsty Ogian horde that drove through the perimeter walls with battering rams and engines of war. The Dracarum raised Lucos to the ground, and only a handful of survivors escaped to tell of the dreadful battle. You see, we've got a couple shields here, one with a crazy looking demon on it, one with some kind of dragon head or something. Flower dragon? I don't know what's going on with this head. The situation is grave, reports Lord Adamas on returning from an emergency conclave of his fellow Telestrian knights. Hey, great Sam Fisher, how you doing? Splinter Cell games, love them. Sam Fisher, good character. For decades, Zegrin and his minions have raided our northern territories. But never before with such determination and strength. We must mobilize our army for war, for it is war that Ogia has invited by its unforgivable attack on Lukos. I must return to Garthen to muster my retainers in preparation for battle and inform the queen of the evil that threatens her well. I can no longer escort you to the Danarg, though your quest must proceed in spite of all that conspires against it. He sends for his scribe, who, dic who arrives with helpers laden with the paraphernalia of his craft. He dictates an order of safe conduct and sets the impression of his signet ring into the hot wax seal before passing the parchment to you. This is um, a series of game books that were written back in the 80s and they've been converted to a digital format online uh, that, I, that I used to read when I was uh, a kid. 
And like as you go through, you make decisions, kind of like a choose your own adventure. But then there's also like rules and stats to it, and you have like a combat, and you have to roll random numbers, and you've got like different abilities and stuff that you can use and like inventory and so it's kind of like just a book but it's also a game it's a game book that's what they called them they don't really make game books anymore since video games became more popular and and ubiquitous but mostly it's a lot of reading so let's see he put his signet ring into the wax our northern people are a frontier breed, wary and suspicious of strangers. If challenged, show this pass and your safe passage will be assured by all who are loyal to Queen Yvain. Mark this pass on your action chart as a special item, which you carry tucked inside your tunic. Alright, so... I can get rid of the power key and the gold key from the last book. I'm not going to need those anymore, so now I have a pass. And early next morning, Lord Adamas accompanies you and Pido to the main square of Fina. It is from here that your quest begins. The first leg of your journey to the Dinarg will take you north to the town of Tharo, which nestles in the fertile uplands of Telestria. There are two ways of reaching the town. You can travel by road, or you can take a barge along the river Fien. Consult the map before deciding which route to take. So I can go by barge... Or I can ride along the Great North Road. Let's, um... Let's take a look at the map. I forgot to bring back the cover from the last time. Oops. Here we are in Fina, right here. We're trying to get to the Dinarg. So, there's Tharo. Uh, what are our options again? Tharo by barge or Tharo by road, basically. Well, I mean, it's sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other, except for the fact that every time we get on a boat, something terrible happens to the boat. So I think we're just going to go by horse up the road. No no barges for us this time. We're not going to go barging in there. <laughs> Let me bring the cover back up. There it is. Okay. Barge it is. No. I already talked myself out of it. Great North Road it is. The morning sky is filled with a sullen gray haze, and around you the tall plains grass undulates like a green sea, stirred to motion by a chill westerly breeze. The Great North Road cuts a straight line to the horizon, with tracks that lead to cottages and farmsteads branching off at regular intervals. Sheep and cattle graze by the roadside, and the air is rich with the scents of the farmyard, flowers, and damp grass. We should reach Tharo by sundown, you comment, checking your position on the map. Maybe, replies Pido cautiously, and points to a menacing streak of blue-black cloud rolling across the skyline from the west. Just so long as we stay ahead of the storm. By noon, you have put 30 miles behind you, but still have 30 more to ride before you reach the town of Tharo. Steadily, the sky is darkening, and what began as fine drizzle has now developed into sheets of heavy rain. Both of you are drenched, and your horses are beginning to steam as they splash through the ankle-deep puddles that punctuate the muddy highway. Through the pall of rain, you see an inn on the banks of a stream, whose waters are greatly swollen by the storm. A wide stone bridge spans the rushing torrent, and a mill with a thatched roof stands close by. We could stop at the inn, we could uh, seek shelter at the mill, or we could just keep riding on. I'm always up for stopping at an inn when we get a chance, so let's, um, let's do that. You stable both horses and investigate the mouth-watering smell of freshly baked wheat cakes that wafts from the doorway of the inn. Welcome! Hails a friendly voice as you cross the threshold. Come in and dry yourselves by the fire! And here is the gentleman that awaits us as we walk in. That, uh, very distinctive Gary Chalk animation there. 
He's got his eye patch. Quite a beard. He's he looks like a friendly sort. A black bearded dwarf with an equally black patch covering his right eye stands behind the counter, his barrel like body obscured from the chest down. Perhaps you two gentlemen would care for some fare! With an open sweep of his hands, he draws your attention to the plates of cakes and kegs of ale that are spread along the bar. Um. Let's engage the dwarf in conversation. The dwarf's face beams with pride as he prepares to talk on his favorite subject, himself. Nearly an hour later, you have heard all there is to hear about the life and hopes of Larden, son of Cordon, Cardin of Boar. What news have you of Lucos? asks Pido as the dwarf takes a rare pause for breath. News of a kind that's becoming only too familiar around these parts, he replies in a disgruntled tone. That Zegrun's bitten off more than he can chew this time. Once Lord Adamas and the army boys come down on him, he'll wish he'd stayed in his stinking city of Zanar. You mark my words. Don't be too sure of that, Larden, says a rosy-faced farmer, who has sidled along the bar to join in your conversation. My sister reckons that this time Zegrun won't stop until he's flattened everything between Lucos and the Tentarius. That stargazing sister of yours is full of good news. When has she ever seen anything cheerful with her telescopes and charts and crystal balls, eh? Answer me that! Agreement rumbles from the tavern crowd, now openly listening to the discussion. That's as may be, retorts the farmer. But when has she ever been wrong, eh? An uncomfortable silence fills the inn, and slowly the crowd return to their own business. None, least of all the innkeeper, chooses to pursue the matter further. So, it'd be interesting to meet this sister, who is apparently some sort of astrologer, or astronomer, or both. Or some sort of diviner, soothsayer, psychic, prophet, seer, you know, something like that. Yeah, I do wish to ask the farmer where his sister lives, actually. I mean, don't take this the wrong way, farmer guy, but uh, tell me how to get to your sister's house. <laughs> Sounds bad when you say it like that. Tadia still lives with her mother at Fairy House, replies the farmer. Five miles north of here, there's a junction where a track heads east. The signpost there says, to top em. A mile past Topham, you come to Fairy House on the banks of the River Fiend. If it's her council you're after, you better take plenty of gold. She's wont to charge a high price for her crystal gazing. You thank the farmer for his advice and suggest to Pido that the time has come to continue your journey north. As you are about to leave, the farmer calls out, By the way, you'd best tell her Jacko sent you. She don't take kindly to folks who drop by uninvited. Alright, I'll tell her Jacko sent me. Moving on. The rain beats down relentlessly as you ride the featureless highway to Thoreau. Thunder rumbles over the western hills like the growl of doom wolves stalking their prey. Gradually, the muddy road descends into a wide valley and a track joins it from the east. A battered signpost at the junction points along the track. It says, Topham, nine miles. I stare at it in absolute shock and awe that a signpost is able to speak. Are you some kind of intelligent signpost? How did you say that, signpost? What else can you say? Oh, he means it reads top of nine miles. That makes so much more sense because if the signpost suddenly started talking, I would think it would be a bigger deal. There'd be like an animation of this talking signpost or something. I'm being a bit of an asshole. All right, so let me change direction and ride east. The track winds through the center of the valley, following the course of a stream that meanders towards the River Fien. It flows alongside a white brick house, turning its water wheel with a comforting, regular sound. As you ride past the house and over a tiny, hump-backed bridge, a cluster of cottages and an abbey come into view. 
In the grounds of the abbey, a burial is taking place. A circle of monks dressed in hooded brown robes are lowering a coffin into one of several freshly dug graves. So here we have an image of some monks with a coffin. I mean, we assume they're monks. They have monkish robes with tied up with ropes and so forth. I do have the Magna Chi Discipline of Divination, so I'm going to use that. The monks are communicating telepathically. Although you do not recognize the language they are using in their mind speech, you sense that they are anxious and uneasy in your presence. The monks of Telestria are infamous for their gluttony. Tales of their 30-course meals and week-long banquets are well known throughout Magnamund. However, Despite their voluminous robes, you cannot help but notice how emaciated these monks appear to be. I don't think these are the real monks. I think these are some sort of evil darkspawn hellgasts or undead or something. I'm going to stop to pay my respects to the deceased and kill some evil fake monks. At your approach, the monks step back from the grave and draw themselves into a line. That's what evil people do. Their hooded heads stay bowed and their hands remain hidden inside the generous folds of their robes. You ask the name of the unfortunate deceased, but the echo of your voice and the constant drip of the steady rain is your only answer. All at once, as if in response to a silent signal, the monks throw back their hoods to reveal ghastly, fleshless faces. Called it... By the gods, gasps Pido. They emit a hideous shriek, panicking the courses. As you fight to control your frightened animal, the skeletal monks spring forward to attack, I told you. Now it's like, if you possess a towel, turn to eight. And I'm like, no, I don't have a towel anymore. Where did my towel go? No, it's Amr's word. Yes, I do possess it, which means this is about to be undead ass whooping time. As you unsheathe the sun sword, a shimmering pulse of golden flame engulfs the blade from hilt to tip. Your attackers hesitate as the pure light washes over their hellish faces. They shriek with malice and leap forward once more, their bony hands now clutching weapons of black steel, previously hidden beneath their robes. And here we have a nice illustration of a hellish bony face creepy looking eyes, a very scary looking black dagger with a skull pommel, you know, they look like they ain't playing. It's alright though, I have the Somersword, Sword, so I'm about to beat some ass. Oh, they're Vordax, these aren't just some random skeletons. I remember fighting a Vordax in book one and it almost kicking my ass, now I'm fighting multiple Vordax, but it's okay, because I have the Somersword. Sword. Unless you possess the Magna Chi Discipline of Animal Control, deduct three points from your combat skill for the duration of the fight. These undead are immune to Mind Blast, but not Psy Surge. Remember to double all endurance point losses sustained by your enemy due to the power of the Samus Word. Okay. So I have to deduct three from my combat skill. Because my horse is going crazy, I guess. I don't get to use Mind Blast. Which means they get a little bit of a combat skill advantage on me. But, with the double damage they're going to take from the Summer Sword, this should still be a, pretty much a mop-up. Here we go, round one. I lost four, they lost ten. Round two. I lost none, they lost twenty. Round three. I lost one, they lost all the rest of their endurance. So I just cleaved mightily through those Vordax with my Summer Sword like it was no problem at all. Let me remember to restore my combat skill to its starting score. And uh, we'll move forward. I'm a tutelary, son. Don't you guys know I'm a tutelary? <laughs> you ain't dealing with some lowly primate here. <laughs> Your ears are filled, wait. <clears throat> your ears are filled with a loathsome hissing as the bodies of your slain enemies dissolve into the mud. You stare at their smoldering remains, and a cold chill grips your heart as you speculate on why these foul servants of the Dark Lords came to this sleepy Telestrian hamlet. Inside the abbey, you discover the grisly answer. 
Scattered throughout the chambers and corridors are the bodies of dead monks, their lifeless faces frozen in masks of horror. Several have been stripped of their robes, presumably to provide a disguise for their killers. Why would the Dark Lords want to take control of this abbey? asks Pido, horrified at the sight of such slaughter. I fear it is part of their plan to conquer Telestria, you reply. It is always their strategy to infiltrate a land with agents before invading. When invasion is launched, these agents rise up and attack from within. So you think that the Dark Lords plan to invade Telestria? says Pido, aghast at the possibility of such event. I suspect that their plan is already underway, you say thoughtfully. Perhaps the destruction of Lucos was masterminded not in Zanar, but in Helgadad. Pido helps you to bury the monks in the graves already dug by their killers. As you cover the last of the bodies with soil, you notice a small, pear-shaped stone lying on the pathway. Its speckled blue surface is mirror-smooth, and, despite its size, it feels remarkably heavy. It's heavy for its size, huh? <laughs> my, my buddy, my old roommate, hates that phrase. It's like a pet peeve of his. He just thinks it's so stupid for people to say heavy for its size because, like, a size doesn't automatically imply a weight, but whatever. It's just, he just always harps on that phrase, so he would find this particular little bit funny. You suspect it is very valuable and decide to keep it. Mark this lodestone on your action chart as a special item that you carry in your belt pouch. If you already carry your maximum number of special items, you must discard one in favor of this new item. So basically, you gotta take this lodestone. It's not optional. Alright, what am I gonna get rid of? Um, I don't think I'm gonna need the Kazan Oud Platinum Amulet anymore. Although, it protects you against heat and fire, right? That could still actually be useful. I can't get rid of the pass. I don't want to get rid of anything else. I'll just throw the dagger of Vashna off here on the side of the road. It'll be fine. Um, Special items are starting to get full of stuff I don't want to lose. Alright, I'm going to take the gamble that I won't ever need the Kazanud Platinum Amulet. And I'm going to take the Lodestone. Wait, wait a minute. I didn't need to get rid of anything, did I? 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, this is 10, 11. Never mind. Come down. I, I can take this and keep the Kazan Oud Platinum Amulet. Now I don't remember how you spell Kazan Oud. I can keep my bling. All right. But if I find another thing, I've got to get rid of it. Right? Yeah. All right, let's move forward. Shafts of sunlight break through the slate gray cloud and the rain eases off and finally stops. You ride across the rolling valley floor toward the River Fiend until the track stops at a ramshackle house perched precariously on the riverbank. An old wooden jetty juts out from the side of the house, its platform almost submerged in the rain's swollen water. A notice board standing in front of the house reads, Oh, this one reads, it doesn't say, okay. So maybe the other one really was talking. Ferry house landing. Passenger barges to Tharo embark from this jetty. Barges to Fina embark from the opposite bank. No cattle, wagons, caravans, or herd animals unless by special arrangement. I'm going to investigate the ferry house, obviously. Always investigate everything you can investigate. I mean, that's just a no-brainer. Wait. One, two, three. Healing. You climb the creaky stairs that lead to the front door and rap the wrought iron knocker. 
The door squeaks open slowly, and you are greeted by what appears to be a bundle of rags and hair. After staring at it for a few moments, you realize with disbelief that the ill-smelling mound before you is alive. The hair parts and a face appears, crevassed with dirt-encased wrinkles. What do you want? croaks the old woman, grinning a yellow, mirthless grin. Hey, Jacko, uh, I'm sorry I referred to your sister as an ill-smelling mound, but, uh, <laughs> this is awkward. Jeez, that's hateful. Yes, I have met Jacko. Or Jocko, or... Or Hucko. A yellow, mirthless grin. Ain't no mirth in that grin. I wish to see Tadia, you say, bowing politely, so as not to appear threatening to the frail old crone. Are you the fair lady I seek? A smile crumples her face, and a blush, like an angry bruise, discolors her leathery cheeks. I am her mother, she says coyly. What is it you wish to see her about? Before you can answer, a young woman's voice calls from inside the house. Show them in, Mother. I've been expecting them. The old woman leads you and Pido to a room at the top of the stairs. Books and charts, stacked high on shelves and scattered about the floor, fill the room which is illuminated by daylight streaming through a domed portal in the ceiling. A massive bronze telescope is fixed to the portal, and below it rests a circular table of carved bone set with gems. Wow. Seated at the table is a beautiful young woman. Her hair is silken gold, and around her high, pale forehead she wears a circlet of jet inlaid with runes and mystic symbols. Oh, she's got some she's got some bling too. So here's the Gary Chalk illustration of the beautiful young woman. She's rather severe looking. She doesn't look like she's here to take any shit. I'll take I'll tell it I'll say that about her. She looks like this is not her first rodeo, let's put it that way. Um... Right. Bone set with gems, that's pretty crazy. Alright, let's see what happens next. I am Tadia the Prophetess, she says, her voice soft and lilting, and you are Lone Wolf. Lord of the Sun Realm, Skarn of Legend. Pido reaches for his sword, but you stay his hand, for you sense that this woman wishes to help, not harm you. We live in an age of great peril. Your enemies of old are our enemies. They stand poised to conquer our land, and I fear we are too weak to resist them. Your purpose is known to me and I will aid you all I can in the hope that you will fulfill your destiny and destroy the champions of darkness. Tadia raises her arms and points towards the sky. Floating in the air between her parted hands appears a spinning globe of white fire. She tilts back her head and stares into this ball of flame, her eyes unblinking despite the fearful intensity of the light. Your safest passage to the Danarg is through the Mordril Forest, she says solemnly. The road to Siada is fraught with danger. Only battle and death await you there. The globe flickers and fades and Tadia returns her gaze to you. Let nothing delay your quest, Lone Wolf. The future of both our lands depends on your success. Before you leave the Prophetess, before you leave, the prophetess offers you- should have been a comma right there. Maybe not, but I would have put one there. Before you leave, the prophetess offers you a choice of potions and weapons. You may take whatever you wish, but remember to amend your action chart accordingly. Choose from the following. Uh, there's a potion of Alather, plus two combat skill for one combat, a potion of Lomspur, standard healing potion, a broadsword, a quarterstaff, a Rendalem's elixir, Restores six endurance points, enough for one dose. A tincture of oxidine restores two endurance points. It's like the little like that's the off-brand healing potion. That's the, that's the generic. 
All potions are backpack items. If you are infected with the Coravax Bacillus, you may use the tincture of Oxidine to cure yourself. Oh! That, oh, so it's actually better. It's got a special use. All right, well, let's take some of this stuff now that I have all kinds of backpack space. First of all, meals, get to stepping. What am I going to take? One, two... I'm taking all those potions. Let's kick some meals the fuck out of my backpack. I'm just carrying those because I can. Potion of Alather. Plus two CS. Or one... Combat. Potion of Lomsper, another one of those. Control C, Control V. Uh, Rendalum's Elixir. Heals six and tincture. Wait a minute, can I just get slick here? Oh, hell yeah. Plus cure I put there, so I remember that it's, you know. Okay, good. I just loaded up with a bunch of new potions. Fun times. Once you've made your choice, you leave the fairy house and continue. Wait. She wasn't letting me choose one of these things, right? I could take whatever I want? Yeah, okay, I could take whatever I want. She's like, take one of these things, and I'm like, I'll take this, and this, and this, and this, thanks! I'm out of here! Now that that towel's out of my backpack, I have all kinds of room. But nothing can fill the hole that the towel left behind. As you descend the steps of the fairy house, Pido catches sight of something glinting in the distance. It's the barge! He says, shielding his eyes from the sun, which is shining at last. A team of bedraggled Gorkas are hauling the vessel upstream. Oh, those Gorkas, they're always getting so bedraggled, you know? Just, every time I see Gorkas, they're bedraggled. It's just a standard phrase, I think, that people say. How are you feeling today? I'm bedraggled as a Gorka, how about you? Seemingly unaffected by the storm's strength and flow, eventually the barge arrives at the jetty and stops to allow a motley assortment of peasants and travelers to disembark. You two going to Tharo? asks the captain. The fare's forty loon apiece, and that includes your horses. If I want to board the barge, pay forty loon and turn to 266, that's ten gold crowns. If I don't want to board, Turn to 348. I'm not really feeling this whole barge idea. Let me check something real quick. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the old map for a moment. Yeah, I'm, I don't think I want to take a barge. I really don't. So I'm turning to 348. Like, I know what I'm doing. If I was a primate, maybe I'd get on that barge. But I'm a fucking tutelary. Tutelaries don't just jump on barges all willy-nilly. We had best delay no longer, Lone Wolf, says Pido, looking anxiously at the afternoon sky. The highway is no place to be after dark, and we're still a long ride from Taro. You nod your agreement and spur your horse along the track toward the village of Topham. I do possess a lodestone. Ooh, creepy. Your horse becomes skittish when it sees the abbey loom into view. The painful memory of the Vordak attack is still fresh in its mind. Pido's horse behaves in exactly the same manner, and you are forced to ride cross-country, making a wide detour to avoid the abbey before rejoining the track and reaching the Great North Road. Just in case you forgot, there were Vordaks in monk's robes there a bit ago. Looking at you all cray. Alright, moving on. It is late afternoon when you ride into Stia, a village comprising a score of cottages and a dilapidated hut which sits astride the Great North Road. As you approach the tiny thatched hut, its stable door swings open and an old man steps out of the shadows. He is wearing an odd assortment of antique armor and regalia that clanks and rattles like a cartload of rusty metal as he shuffles across your path. Wow. 
This guy's like a cartload of rusty metal. Which I guess is a better thing to be than an ill-smelling mound. Or whatever they said about the poor woman. Yeah, this guy... Wow, he is looking... That guy looks bedraggled as a Garka. Let me just put it that way. Garkas sometimes refer to themselves as being as bedraggled as this guy. Like, this guy's taking it to the hoop when it comes to being bedraggled. He's got all kinds of stuff hanging on with these, like a great helm hanging off him in the back. He's got a walking stick with a little pouch attached. This is a very detailed picture. Some of these Gary Chalk uh, illustrations are really... They're really good. Such a distinctive style, you know? You never, you would never mistake Gary Chalk's illustrations for somebody else's. That's for sure. Wow. Had some problems with dentistry, apparently. Alright. Cartload of rusty metal, man. Ho there, strangers! He blusters, his croaky voice full of self-importance. Proceed no further till you pay the toll! You draw your horse to a halt and stare down at the ridiculous-looking figure. By what authority do you level your toll on the Queen's Highway? Asks Pido, irritated by the delay. By the authority of the Queen herself! Retorts the old man, indignantly, point indignant. Whoa, having issues here. Indignantly, pointing with crooked finger to a placard on the wall of his hut. It bears the faded seal of Queen Evain, but the board is so weathered that the words above it are illegible. We travel to Tharo on royal business, you say, showing the pass given to you by Lord Adamas. Stand aside and let us proceed. The old man snatches the pass from your hand and scrutinizes it, though it is obvious that his eyesight is so poor that he cannot read the contents. Bah! He snorts, thrusting the pass back into your hand. It's a forgery! You'll not fool me with that worthless scrap of vellum! And will not be taken in by a greedy old fool whose wits are as rusty as the armor he wears! shouts Pido angrily. As his words echo along the street, a dozen villagers, armed with an assortment of farming tools, come to investigate the commotion. They form up in a line behind the old man, ready to enforce his demand. I can just see it now. The farmers attack you. You must fight them as one enemy. You cannot evade combat. And it's like farmers, combat skill 12 or whatever. I just have to butcher some farmers. Now, that would not exactly be a bold, brave, heroic moment in Lone Wolf's story. What is the toll, you ask? Only a trinket that you may have that takes our fancy, that is all! One item apiece, and you can continue on your way, replies the old man, smugly. But let it not be said that we are without wit, he snaps, glaring at Pido. We Steans pride ourselves on our sense of fair play and our love of riddles. Therefore, I shall make you an offer that satisfies us both. Answer me one riddle correctly and you can pass through our village without paying the toll. Answer wrongly or give no answer at all and you must pay the toll without question. Is it agreed? Um... Yeah, I'll agree. Why not? Sounds sounds like a blast. Good! Good! He exclaims gleefully, twisting his droopy mustache as he paces the muddy road. Answer me this riddle. If a brick counterbalances three quarters of a pound, plus three quarters of a brick, how many pounds does the whole brick weigh? All right, let me take a th th think about this for a second. Okay, so 
The brick has to weigh... Three quarters of a pound has to be one quarter of a brick, right? So really we're talking about the brick weighing 12 quarters of a pound, which would be three pounds, right? If it weighs three pounds, uh, right? If it weighs three pounds, three quarters of a pound, Three quarters of three pounds. Jeez, I'm having problems speaking here. Three quarters of three pounds w would be... Uh, 2.25 pounds. 2.25 pounds plus 0.75 pounds, which is what three quarters of a pound is, would equal three pounds. So it has to be three. It has to be three pounds. So the section corresponding to the correct answer will have a footnote confirming that it's correct. So let me try it. Okay, let's go into section three. This is the correct answer. Thank you, yay. If I was a mere primate, I might not have got that, but I'm a fucking tutelary. Tutelary's answer riddles. Don't even trip. That's what tutelary means. It means riddle answerer in some language. The villagers give a spontaneous cheer when they hear you answer the old man's riddle correctly. Well done, he says. You're right. If the brick counterbalances three quarters of a brick plus three quarters of a pound, then a quarter of a brick must weigh three quarters of a pound. The whole brick must weigh four times as much as this, which is, of course, three pounds. The villagers are as good as their word. They stand aside and wish you safe passage as you leave Stia and continue your ride north. I feel like when I was like nine or ten years old and first read this book, I, I probably solved that in like half the time that it took me right now. A quarter of the time, probably. <laughs> Alright, so... Moving forward. The sun is setting as you catch your first glimpse of Tharo on the road ahead. Mud-colored walls, tall and fortified, surround the houses which sit atop a broad grassy rise known as Fortress Hill. Soldiers in tunics of scarlet and gray patrol the walls and stand guard at the huge wooden doors that grant access to the town's south quarter. You ride along the straight dirt road towards a stone bridge, which arches across a man-made canal encircling the hill. Once over the bridge, you pass up a ramp leading to the gatehouse. At the gate, a square-jawed soldier in silver chainmail. Probably not literally silver chainmail, right? Because that would be ridiculous. Not only would it be prohibitively expensive, but silver doesn't exactly make a great metal for arms and armaments. So, I, I assume it's like silvery, but really it's probably made out of fucking steel, right? I mean, because if this guy's just wearing a whole suit of chainmail made out of silver, I'm going to roll this fool. <laughs> but, let's just go on. A square-jawed soldier in silver chainmail... Demands to know your business before he will allow you entry to the town. <laughs> no, I'm not going to show you my pass. If you wish to be a petulant ass for no reason, turn to 92. Now I'll show him my pass. Upon seeing Lord Adamas's seal, the guard returns your pass, salutes, and commands that the gate be opened without a delay. You pass through the gatehouse arch and enter an open courtyard. Two avenues lead from the courtyard. Copperpiece Lane and Hogfoot Run. <laughs> wow. Hogfoot Run sounds like a party waiting to happen. I I mean, my my every instinct I have seems like you definitely go to Copperpiece Lane, not Hogfoot Run. But Hogfoot Run sounds like it will be zany. And, and crazy things might occur there, so I kind of have to go to Hogfoot Run, don't I? Yeah, it's Hogfoot Run all day. 
You follow the narrow, winding street, passing rows of dusty houses and shops. The noisy clack of window shutters signifies an end to another day's business as the shopkeepers close for the night. The street turns eastwards and begins to climb Fortress Hill. Halfway up the rise, you approach a squat building of green glazed stone. A fat merchant stands in the doorway, waiting impatiently for customers despite the late hour. Good evening, gentlemen, he says in a thin and wheedling voice. Welcome to the Emporium of Rathradis, the storehouse of miracles. Through the open doorway, you can see that the shop is brimful of curious magical paraphernalia. Oh yeah, we gotta check this shop out. Row upon row of glass-fronted cases fill the shop. They house many thousands of curios, each one bearing a tag, neatly displaying the price of the item. Does he have a towel for sale? No? There is a scroll parchment for spells, cubes of rare metal, amulets, talismans, ritual candles, potions and powders, rings and rods, and relics of long-dead heroes. The display is fascinating, but your attention is drawn to one item in particular, a ring of translucent gray crystal. Your basic Kai senses reveal that nearly all the mystical items for sale in the shop are simply clever fakes designed to fool the gullible. But the gray crystal ring radiates an energy that is genuinely magical. The price of the gray crystal ring is 120 loon. Hmm. 30 gold crowns. I'm very intrigued by this option that says if you wish to purchase the ring but can't afford it. Like, what do you get to do? But I can afford it, so I cannot rightly turn to that section. Unless it's in the sense that, like, you would say you can't afford something even if you technically have enough. Like, it's not in my budget. <laughs> like, I technically have the 30 crowns, but, like, you know... I'm sorry, I just can't justify spending 30 crowns right now, so in that sense, I can't afford it. It's not in the budget, I'm sorry. I got bills to pay. No, I, I, don't, I don't think that's gonna fly. Should I buy the ring? Probably should. I mean, the 30 crowns isn't really what I'm worried about, although that is a lot of crowns. It's the fact that I have to get rid of something. And I don't know what to get rid of. I'm not allowed to get rid of the pass or the lodestone. Which means, again, we're back to just getting rid of the Kazan Ud Platinum Amulet. And that is a magic item in its own right, right? I mean, it could still be useful. I don't know what the hell this ring's gonna do. On the other hand, if they want 30 crowns for it, it's probably good. That's a lot of money to ask for something. If it, you know, if it doesn't, if it sucks, right? So it's probably something pretty rad. So I should probably buy- I mean, I could get rid of the fire seeds, but... They seem like they're the kind of thing that would come up for use, though. Alright, fuck it. Kazan Ud Platinum Amulet, you're done. I'm just gonna take a gamble that that thing's never gonna get used again. And I'm gonna buy this damn ring. 30 gold crowns, that's a grip. But, I still have 15. The merchant grins delightedly as he pockets your gold. You take the gray crystal ring from the display case and slip it onto the index finger of your right hand. Why would I put it on my index finger? Do I already have a ring on my ring finger? Am I married? Index finger? What? That doesn't even make sense. I mean, unless you already had rings on your... It fits perfectly. Mark this gray crystal ring as a special item on your action chart. If you wish to dispose of any... What? If you wish to dispose of any special items, with the exception of the ring you've just purchased, 
The merchant will pay you eight gold crowns for each item you sell. Hold on. First of all, I'm going to get eight for that fucking amulet I just sold. Do I want to sell anything else? No. I still want to keep all the rest of this stuff. I'll take eight gold crowns for the Somrus word, sir. Thank you. Pleasure doing business with you. Alright, well I got eight crowns back, so that helps pay for the... Partially pay for the, uh... That brings me back up to 23. I'm feeling that. Leave the shop and continue. You arrive at a flagstoned quadrangle. It is well lit by street lanterns, which hang from the first floor balcony of a large and unusual building constructed of blue stone, with silver and scarlet veins running through it. That sounds like a cool building. The bricks have been polished to give a mirror-like shine. A huge wooden door, banded with copper, dominates the entrance, above which a bronze cast depicts a flaming broadsword with the words... Temple of the Sword, engraved along the blade. Beyond the temple, a street ascends to a stone watchtower. It is built on the peak of a hill and dominates the town. Alright, I do not have a map of Tharo, unfortunately. I do have Pathsmanship, though. Let's check that out. To the left of the main door, you notice three symbols engraved in the speckled blue stone. A bed, a horse, and a loaf of bread. You recognize their significance, for you have seen similar markings on hostels and monasteries during your travels in the east. By displaying these symbols, the monks of this temple offer travelers a meal, stabling for their horses, and a bed for the night. Yeah, this place sounds great. Let's, let's check it out. There's no way I'm not going inside a place called Temple of the Sword. Cut the games. You dismount and climb the steps leading to the temple doors. An old man in brown robes answers your knock. I'm starting to be think that like almost every person in this world is old. Seems like 90% of the NPCs I meet are old. Invites you and Pido inside. A novice attends to your horses. Stepping through the door is like stepping into another world. The theme song to that old show, A Different a different World, just popped into my head. You know, like the spin-off show from the Cosby show? It's a different world. I don't really remember how it went, but it still popped into my head. The air is sweet with incense, and the flickering light, cast by a long row of squat red candles, does little to illuminate the interior. You follow the old man along a vaulted corridor, down several flights of stairs, and finally into a torch-lit refectory. A delicious smell of cooking wafts from an open hatch in the wall, together with the sounds of people in the kitchen beyond. Be seated, says the old man, pointing to a stout oak table laid for supper, and enjoy our humble food. May it revive you after your travels, and fortify you for the road ahead. Another monk enters the chamber, carrying two steaming plates of meat stew. We're not gonna specify what kind of meat, huh? This is already suspect. The monks are cannibals! He sets them down before you, and blesses the food with the words... Gashkog Zutag. Why does that sound like... Gyak? <laughs> What is that? What language are you speaking, sir? You were hungry after your day's journey and must now eat a meal or lose three endurance. I really don't need to because I have hunt mastery, so I could have hunted up some shit on my way here, but... Should I eat the appetizing stew? Should we trust these monks? Can I get some sixth sense happening here, or what, man? Gashkog Zutag doesn't sound at all wholesome. That sounds a whole lot like Giak, I'm just saying. Fuck it, let's eat the stew. What could, what could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? I'm a tutelary, I'll be fine. The stew tastes as good as it smells, and you both make short work of your meal. The monks smile and nod their heads approvingly. Come, the dean wishes to see you before you retire. 
says one, motioning you to follow as they leave the refectory. The Dean's Chamber is a domed, hexagonal room, hung with tapestries depicting strange and grotesque creatures. Numerous plinths stand upon the richly carpeted floor, each supporting large bowls filled to the brim with a silvery liquid. A gust of air disturbs the tapestry on the far wall. Seconds later, it is moved aside to reveal an elderly man, huh, they're all old, in a hooded black robe. Have they eaten? He asks, his voice strangely cold and monotonal. I think you mean monotonous. No, I guess you don't mean monotonous. I don't, I've never seen monotonal used as a word before, but I guess he's saying like monotonal basically like his voice is just flat like one tone I don't know yes master the monks reply with one voice good he says stepping closer leave us the monks depart clicking the door shut behind them gradually the light in the chamber grows dimmer wait a minute now I get to use divination I couldn't have divinationed that these people are evil before I ate the stew? God damn it, Lone Wolf! Learn to use divination before you eat stew, not after. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks for the fucking. Thank. <laughs> late flag on the fucking play, Lone Wolf. Hella late flag. They're practically starting the next play before you threw that fucking flag, Lone Wolf. Do you divine that shit now after I ate the stew? You know, if I still had my towel, this wouldn't have happened. You are in the presence of great evil. Your skin prickles and your blood runs cold as you recoil at this sudden realization. But alarm soon turns to fear as a new threat begins to manifest itself. Your futile quest is over, mortal. I hate it when people call me mortal. Says the hooded man, his emotionless voice like a spike stabbing at your mind. Instinctively, you reach to your weapon, but your hand begins to shake. You cannot control your fingers. You glance at Pido to see that he, too, is shivering uncontrollably. Suddenly, a wave of pain tears at your stomach, and your legs buckle. You groan in agony and drop to your knees, clutching at your burning stomach. Pido lets out a scream of anguish and falls unconscious at your side. You cannot but envy his oblivion as the terrible pain courses through your body. Oh yeah, I got some curing. I got some curing. I just picked it at the start of this book and now I get to use it. Suck it! Sorry, that was the excited about having curing song. And I've reached the rank of primate. I mean, actually, I've surpassed the rank of primate, but I remember my primate days fondly. Yeah, let's do it. I'm just gonna heal this poison right the fuck out of me. Let's see how they feel about that. You muster all your strength to fight the deadly poison which has infiltrated your blood. Your improved power of curing suppresses the pain and slows the progress of the insidious toxin, enabling you to face your would-be assassin. A flicker of surprise registers in the cold, black eyes of your opponent as you stagger to your feet and unsheathe your weapon. Oh yeah, you weren't expecting that, were you? Surprise, motherfucker! Now I got the Somnus word out and I'm about to start chopping up some monk, dude. And I lose five endurance points. Whatever, I didn't even need those endurance points. Don't even talk to me about endurance points. Curing. Thank you, Pido's brother. Gajaki Amaz! Is he talking Giak? I kind of think he is. Hisses the monk, pulling back the hood of his black robe. You gasp in shock as you stare upon a ghastly transformation. The monk's face is writhing and contorting as his skin tightens and grows darker. Tattered flesh drops from his sunken cheeks to hang in festoons beneath the exposed lower jaw. A snake-like tongue, black and narrow, flickers between curved fangs that have risen from the lower jaw. A sickening dread fills your heart as you recognize the creature standing before you. It is a Hellgast, a nightmarish agent of the Dark Lords. Its demonic eyes glow like red-hot coals as it shrieks and raises its claw-tipped hands. 
All right, let me tell you, I'm not really feeling the dread. I've killed several Hellgasts before. Whatever. I killed a Hellgast before I had the Summer Sword. Don't even talk to me, Hellgast. Yes, I possess it. If you don't possess it, you're probably fucked here. But if you do, and I do, then it's time to go to Whoopass Town. What? What? I still have that jeweled mace, too. I think that's also a magical weapon. By the way, I heal myself up a little bit in this little interlude. Whoa, that's a lot of combat skill. Golden fire erupts along the blade of the sun sword as you raise it above your head. The Halgast shrieks and steps back, its eyes glowing red with fear and loathing. It recognizes the power you wield, a power that is the bane of its dark lord masters, a power that can bring about their total destruction. Yeah, you prepare to get somber sworded, motherfucker. I gotta fight the Nog Halgast. This creature is immune to Mind Blast, but not They always want to throw that in your face. Every time they remind me, like, hey, guess what, sucker? If you had Psy Surge, you'd be good to go, but Mind Blast sucks. Unless you possess the Magnetic Discipline of Psy Screen, I don't. You must reduce your endurance by two points at the beginning of every round you fight this creature. If you have completed the Lore Circle of the Spirit, I haven't, you may increase your combat skill by two points for the duration of this combat. All right, let's do this. So, he has a ton of combat skill. Wait, oh, and he's immune to Mind Blast, so I can't even use that. And he's not exactly hurting for endurance, either. So, at the beginning of round one, I've got to take off two endurance. However, he does get a time... Oh, yeah, it's Samus Sword double damage thing. So that's going to make this no problem, really. All right, here's round one. Ready? He lost 16. I lost what? How much did I lose, Hellgast? Oh, that's right, zero. Zero is the number you were looking for. Goose egg. Nada. All right, round two. I got to lose two at the beginning of the round. 27-32, go. I lost two. He lost, I don't know, 14. 14. Rudimentary math skills were telling me 14. So, in other words, I'm whooping that ass. Third round. Lose two endurance at the start of the round. Let's do this. 23-18. Ooh! He's rallying! He took six off me and lost none himself. That's no bueno. Okay. Alright. Alright. I, I can see that you're going to make a fight out of this. No problem. Let's go for... Oh, and I got to lose two more at the beginning. This is, this is starting to hurt. 15, 18. Ooh, I'm down to 10. And he's down to 12, but still. I could lose this fight. Holy shit, because I have to go down to 8 right now. Before the next round. Okay, alright. Let's see what happens. 8 and 12. Oh, I'm down to 2! Which means I lose. Because start of the next round, I lose 2 automatically, and that's going to take me out. I died. This is my second time being defeated in combat. The first time was by Dark Lord Hawken, which I didn't feel bad about, because he was like a major boss. He was the Archlord of fucking Helgadad. Alright, fine, he beats me, no problem, I don't feel bad. But I was all lippy before this fight. I was all like, oh, I'm not feeling the dread, whatever. I kill Helgasts for breakfast and shit. I get up in the morning and kill some Helgasts while I'm brushing my teeth. I just, the only time I stop killing Helgasts is just to kill a Helgast before I continue hel killing Helgasts. I mean, I was all fucking, like, I had hubris going into this. And pride wenteth before a fall in this particular case. Wow, I lost. I straight up lost. Alright, the question is, how much health did I have going into this? Because I have to do the fight again. Alright, hold on. I had 31. Alright, well, that's a death for me. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Wow, that's embarrassing. That's, uh... This is awkward.
I really feel like I shouldn't have lipped off so much before the fight about how easy it was going to be. <laughs> uh, feel that sting? That's pride fucking with you. Alright, so let's try again. It's beginning of round one, I go down to 29. Give him his EP loss multiplier. Here we go, 29.48. I lost six, he lost two. This is not starting off well. 21... 46. Ooh! Oh, he's kicking my ass! I lost five more, he lost six. I go down to 14. Give me a good roll! Uh, that wasn't bad. That wasn't bad. He lost 14. I lost, like, two. 10 and 26. Come on, good roll, good roll. Ooh! He lost 12, I lost three, but still, attrition! This whole losing two points every round is really eating me up. Come on, amazing roll. I need an amazing roll here. Oh, that was pretty good, except I auto-lose again. I got him down to two endurance, but I auto-lose again because I lose two endurance at the start of the round. <laughs> Fuck. I've died twice to this guy. Alright, well, let's try beating him a third time. Let's try beating him a third time. Thirty-four. Forty-eight. Times two. Lose two at the beginning. Round one, let's go. Alright, we both lost a little bit. Twenty-four, forty-four, lose two. Go. Oh, this is bad. He's barely lost any. All right, 14, 42, 12, 28, lose two, go again. Oh, that was good, that was a good round. I didn't lose any and he lost like 18. All right, I might be able to beat him this time, except I go down to eight now. Come on, come on, I need another good roll like that. Eight and 10, yes, yes, yes! I actually thought I was gonna lose another time and I had already decided that if I lost, if I lose a fight three times in a row, I have to go back. However far I have to go back to, like, not have to do the combat. I have to make a different decision. Because if I can't beat something after three times, I'm just gonna assume that I just can't do it, and I have to go back and do a different decision. Like, back to an older save game, essentially. But I managed to beat him on the third try. Ooh, that was... I mean, considering I have the Summer Sword and I do double damage against him, you would think, you know, whatever, I'll kick his ass. But, man, that was way harder way hard oh you know what i should have done god i'm stupid i should have used this potion of alather i forgot i had it that would have really helped <laughs> too late okay i am gonna use one of these other potions though that you can use after a combat it says randalum's elixir drinking it right now six endurance oh i fucked up what did i have five I had five, and now I have 11 because I just drank that elixir. All right, one on the third try. That was, uh, that was humbling. I am humbled. Nog Hellcast worked me over. A wretched cry of pain and despair fills the chamber as you strike the killing blow. The hell gas falls, its flesh transforming into a putrid green gas that seeps from the vents in its tattered robes. In its tattered robe. It only has one. Your mind reels at what has just occurred, but you dare not dwell on the fearful implications, for the poison in your system is beginning to overwhelm your healing power. You must act quickly if you are to save both yourself and Pido from the fatal toxin that is flowing through your veins. I do have Lomspur and Rendalum's Elixir. Well, I just drank my Rendalum's Elixir, but I'm assuming that would count for this also. And I have more Lomspur that I can use for Pido or whatever. And I'm healing myself. And I'm healing myself. You force yourself to swallow the potion and to stay conscious long enough for it to take effect. Gradually, you feel your strength returning. The pain and nausea disappear, and your limbs stop their uncontrollable shivering as the potion and your latent Kai skill neutralize the toxin in your blood. Now you use your skill to try to save your companion's life, 
Placing your hands on his chest, you transfer the warmth of your healing power into Pido's poisoned body, breaking down the toxin by degrees. The treatment is slow and laborious, and it is dawn of the following day before you know for sure if your skill has saved his life. Oh, I see. It's already going off the fact that you said you had curing and were a primate before you got to that fight, so it's assuming you still, you know, that you can do this because you have curing and primate. All right. Good thing I have that curing, huh? This would have been ugly if I didn't. Might have been instant death. If you eat the stew and didn't have curing, might have been instant death. Okay, let's move forward. That was tough. Keep healing. I'm down a lot of endurance. The flicker of an eyelid and a bead of sweat are the first signs of Pido's recovery. Slowly he stirs to consciousness, waking from a sleep that was so nearly his last. He can remember nothing of the ordeal. And when you tell him all that has happened, he shakes his head in disbelief. A hellgast? he says, incredulous. How can it be? The servants of Dark Lord Nag have infiltrated this monastery, you reply. They have kept themselves hidden, but I fear the day is fast approaching when they will rise up and wreak havoc in this town. Already they know our true identities, and I wager they know why we're here. This is bitter news, Lone Wolf, says Pido, his face etched with worry. We can afford to delay no longer. If Telestria falls to Dark Lord Nag before we reach the Danarg, then the quest is lost. It is a sobering thought, but you do not dwell on it. You help Pido to his feet and cast your eyes around the chamber in search of an exit. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Let's heal another point here. I'm a little concerned about getting into another fight right away because my endurance is so low. One of the bowls begins to emit a faint humming sound. The surface of its silvery liquid swirls and glows brighter, casting a phosphorescent light onto the domed ceiling. The sparkling mist slowly clears and a strange image takes shape, condensing and forming into something wholly alien, something that resembles the head of a monstrous fly. Its great multifaceted eyes stare down at you, gleaming darkly with black fire, like two huge clusters of evil jewels. There's the, wow, evil flyman creature. With the multifaceted eyes are straight up creepy. Cut the games. Also, this business up here with the little furry kind of nastiness. Also, all this right here, whatever's happening right here, I don't like it. Also, this right here. Really, there's no part of this that I like except for this nice, nice little arch up here. I'm okay with that part. And his robe. His robe is fine. Nag! Booms a ghastly, rasping voice. Then, with a stifled cry of rage and recognition, the image clouds over and the light fades to a dull glow. The terrible visage of Dark Lord Nog has disappeared. Okay, so this is Dark Lord Nog, the new head honcho of the Dark Lords. He's a fucking evil ass fly man. That's not good. That's just not good. By the gods, gasps Pido, shocked to the core by what he has seen. What manner of beast was that? But you do not reply, for you sense that he already knows the dreadful answer. Swiftly you search the chamber. Behind a throne-like chair of chiseled stone, you discover several useful items. A sword, a bow, three arrows, and enough food for two meals. I'll take a meal. I don't need it really, but I'll take it. Also, set into the back of the chair is a lever. It activates a portal in the opposite wall. The tapestry that conceals it is drawn aside, and you can see a stairway. Wait.
Okay, I already healed myself this... this section. You can see a stairway, flanked by torches, descending to a passage far below. Come, says Pido. This room chills my blood. You move to follow him as he descends the stairs, stopping briefly to kick over the bowl of glowing silvery liquid that projected the image of Dark Lord Nag. Yeah, we're kicking shit over. I stopped to break some pots or something just because I can. Up to 16. It's going to take a while to heal that up. The stairs lead down to a vast network of catacombs that stretch in every direction. It would be easy to lose yourself in this maze of tunnels, but your Kai tracking skills, heightened by the pressing need to escape from the monastery, help you avoid the hazards and dead ends of these sprawling burial vaults. Following the sound of dripping water, you discover a circular trap... Wow, the word circular really tripped me up there. You discover a circular stone trap door in the ceiling. Pido cups his hands around your foot, and lifts you near the tunnel roof, enabling you to open the trap door. Early morning daylight streams into the passage as you lift the slab of wet stone and slide it aside. You have emerged at the courtyard on the north side of the monastery. You know, I've had bad fucking luck with monasteries this game. This book. That's two monasteries in a row where they went all bajiggity and were all dark lords and evil and shit. I'm gonna have to look with some real critical eye at monasteries from now on. The monasteries are getting into the same categories as boats at this point. Two monks stand guard at the double doors of a low, timber-framed building on the other side of the paved enclosure. Fortunately, a line of bushy fruit trees that encircles the courtyard provide all the cover you need to avoid their watchful eyes. You crouch in the shadows and watch as the monks leave their posts to enter the building. Minutes later, the doors swing open and they reappear, both on horseback, and ride off through an archway to the right. The courtyard is now empty, but you curse their departure, for the horses they are riding belong to you and Pido. God damn it. Damn horse-stealing evil monks. Alright, we can go into the stables, maybe we'll get some more horses, but if they have more horses in there, why would they have taken ours? <sighs> Hashtag tutelary problems. Or we can escape on foot through the archway. Okay, so let's um, let's enter the stables. I'm feeling that. I'm feeling like I get a point back. The stable is full of fine horses, all of them as sound and sturdy as the mounts given to you by Lord Adamas. Pido acts as lookout while you saddle up two black stallions. You are making the final adjustments to their bridles when Pido hisses a warning. Four monks coming this way! You mount your fresh steeds and gallop out of the stables, scattering the startled monks who had just reached the door. In an act of desperation, one of the monks unsheathes his sword and hurls it at your back. The deadly blade spins through the air with alarming accuracy. Listen, asshole. You've watched too many movies. Swords are not for throwing. Try that shit in real life. I have to pick a random number. If I have Hunt Mastery and Divination, oh yeah, I do. I get to add three, which means I automatically succeed, obviously, but let's pick the number anyway. I got This happened the last time! Do you remember that? The last time I, I just barely was able to do something because I rolled a zero and I totally would have failed, but I got to add exactly the amount that I needed. That's twice now that that exact thing has happened and I rolled a zero. That's funny. It's really funny. Because I am guarantee you zero to two is instant death. Instant death, yeah. Okay. So, let's move forward here. While I'm making this bold escape on horseback, I'm also healing myself. The sword whistles past your head and gouges a chunk of stone from the courtyard arch. 
You hear the monks shouting, and you dig in your heels, steering your horse through the archway and along a narrow street that leads to the quadrangle. Quadrangle is a funny word. At this early hour, there are a few obstacles to slow your escape as you gallop headlong through the twisting streets of Tharo. It is not until you reach the town's north gate that you finally rein in your horse to a halt. Heal. The north gate guards, tired after the long night's watch, grumble wearily at your demand for the gate to be opened. What's the hurry? growls one guardsman. Matter of life and death, is it? Sneers the other. The portcullis finally clanks open and you leave the town, riding the broken dirt track towards the distant hills and the frontier town of Siada. Gray-brown grasses brush your shins as you cross this wild, uncultivated plain. Accompanying your ride is an unnatural silence which is broken only occasionally by the cawing of ravens circling like vultures overhead. By midday you are among the hills. The terrain becomes increasingly rocky, undulating like a storm-tossed ocean. The tall plains grass has given way to sad little plants, scraggy and deformed, stunted by the winds that sweep down from the barren wastes of Ogia. The track passes through a narrow valley where a small stone cabin stands beside the entrance to a disused mine shaft. As you approach the cabin, you see a face at the window. Uh, I'll stop at the cabin. What could go wrong? That's what I said in the fucking monastery before I ate the stew. You peer through the tiny circular window where you saw the face, but the gloomy interior looks deserted. The stone cabin consists of two rooms, one at the front and one at the rear. Anyone at home? You call in a friendly voice, but you receive no reply. Silently, you motion to Pido to investigate the rear of the hut while you enter at the front door. Now I get to use divination. Thank you. While I'm divining some shit, I heal. You sense that someone is hiding behind the door. He or she is armed and intends to attack you as you enter the hut. Um, I mean, I don't really have a reason to go in this hut. This could be just somebody that's afraid of me and defending their home, like a perfectly innocent person that I'm just barging into their house. On the other hand, I really don't like to leave stones unturned, and this is a fucking stone that's shaped like a cabin. I'm going in. I'm <laughs> going in! Uh-oh, he's a rogue miner. No healing this time. You push open the door and step inside, your weapon poised to counter any sudden attack. The door slams shut and a scar-faced rogue leaps out of the shadows and attacks you with a pickaxe handle. This dude just brought a pickaxe handle to a summer sword fight. Also, he doesn't seem to have a shirt. Nice belly button, bro. Nice little weird vest thing you're wearing. Got some legit 80s hair, too. Alright, pickaxe handle guy. You're about to get worked over because you are not a Nog Hellcast, my friend. He's not immune to Mind Blast or anything. Let's put his paltry 17 combat skill in here. Also, he's undead! No, he's not, but uh, Mind Blast. Alright, that's 30. I have 30 with Mind Blast. Let's do this. 21-25. He took one off me, damn it. But he lost 16. Alright, round two. 29. Took another one off me, but he died. Still, he set me back a couple points, and right now I'm not exactly flush on endurance. So I felt it. I felt it. I got a little bit of a bruise from his pickaxe handle. Of course, he's been cleaved in twain, but, you know, whatever. Should see the other guy and all that. I won. I heal. I read. The rogue slumps dead at your feet. Seconds later, the door to the back room splinters and breaks as Pido hacks through it with his sword. What kept you so long? You ask cheekily, when finally the door gives way and he staggers, sweating and exhausted, into the room. He smiles ruefully, and, after pausing to get his breath back, he invites you to come and see what he has found in the back room. 
Small sacks, each filled with nuggets of silver, are stacked in a huge mound that reaches almost to the ceiling. We could make so much chainmail with this, oh my god! No wonder he fought so desperately, you say, staring at this hoard of treasure. There's enough silver here to pay a king's ransom. You may take some treasure before you leave. Each sack of silver counts as one backpack item. Well, I don't need this meal. I'll take a sack of silver. Just one. I could ditch this other meal and take another one, but I like carrying a meal around in case, like, I need to give food to somebody else. That's never actually come up and happened at any point in the books that I know of. But I always think it might come up. Like, maybe somebody else needs food, and I can give them a meal. Then that's what I want to have a meal for. Like a, you know, like a beggar or a starving family or something. I don't know. It's just best to be prepared. But, I don't need two meals. I, you know, sack of silver. Maybe somebody needs a sack of silver. Alright, let's investigate the mine. Just because, again, that key word, investigate, means Josiah has to do this. Oops. Okay. Investigate the mine. Go. About to heal up while I'm doing that. An old wooden board. See, everything's old, and the, even boards and stuff are old. Nailed across the entrance to the shaft. Warns you to stay away. Now, does that mean it has words? Does it read something that warns? Or is this like that talking post? This is the board itself, like, stay away! <laughs> In, like, board talk. I'm going to assume that it has words, like, etched into it or something. Or painted upon it, or, in, uh, or otherwise inscribed on its surface. This silver mine was closed down shortly after the main tunnel collapsed. Twenty miners were buried alive, and their names are carved into the pit props that surround the entrance to the shaft as a memorial. As you scan the list of names, you hear the tap of a hammer breaking stone in the depths of the shaft. I'm gonna enter the mine. I gotta see what's going on in here. I don't know why, I just do. Maybe somebody needs my help. You duck under the board and step into the gloom, taking care to tread lightly around the mounds of rubble and pools of water that obscure the tunnel floor. Soon the light from the entrance fades into total darkness. Ahead, the sound of hammering continues. I love that I keep to get to keep using the Cult Fire Sphere all these books later. I got that thing in book three, and I've used it several times since then. Here we are in book eight, and I'm still using that thing. Cult Fire Sphere was a worthwhile discovery. You know what didn't get all this love? The towel. If you have a lantern, a torch and tinderbox, a cult fire sphere, or a towel. Yeah. Vance in the dark doesn't sound like a good idea. I actually have a lantern too, don't I? Yeah, I do have a lantern. In the flickering light, you see that a large section of the tunnel floor ahead has collapsed. Gingerly, you edge around the deep hole and continue along the passage. Steadily, the hammering grows louder until you arrive at a new tunnel branching off to the left. Recent excavation has exposed a rich vein of silver ore that glitters brightly. As you peer down the new shaft, you see a dwarf in a miner's hat, hammering at the ore with a mattock. I will call to him. Ha! <laughs> Instant death! Fuck! Oh, I just died again! That is my third death of this book! <laughs> Why? Why? Apparently you do not talk to dwarf miners while they're working. The dwarf stops hammering. Is that you, Filcher? He asks, squinting along the tunnel. When he realizes you are not Filcher, he curses and hurls his mattock at your head. You duck aside, but the pick-like weapon spins past and catches Pido full in the chest. He screams and falls, dying at your feet. Desperately, you try to save him, but the wound is fatal. Anger wells up inside, and you turn to confront his killer, only to find yourself staring into the muzzle of a boar musket. The dwarf pulls the trigger, and you are decapitated by the blast. It may be some consolation to learn that your killer did not escape unpunished. The shockwave of the blast brought down the tunnel ceiling and buried him alive. 
your life and your quest end here. <laughs> that is fucking hateful. God damn it, Joe. How was I supposed to- You talk to a dwarf and you get to cap- I mean, he didn't even like- He didn't fuck around here either. Like, you don't just kind of get killed. You get straight up decapitated. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for that. That's three deaths, this book. That's hateful. Alright. I'm just gonna leave him to his work. The track continues along the rock-strewn valley floor through a thicket of stunted trees and climbs slowly towards a ridge of hills, their peaks worn smooth by countless years of wind and harsh weather. You stop briefly at a babbling stream to allow your horses to drink, and your rumbling stomach reminds you that you are hungry and in need of food. You must now eat a meal or lose three endurance points. Hunt Mastery. When the horses have quenched their thirst, you continue your climb to the ridge. You soon reach the crest and stare down on a sight that sends a shiver down your spine. Uh-oh. I don't like shivers down my spine. In the distance, you see a pall of dense black smoke rising into the sky. At its base, a fortress wall and a cluster of cottages are feeding the greedy flames. Siata burns. To the north of the doomed town, an army of black-clad troops covers the hills. The black wolf-head banners of Ogia sway on long poles, fluttering grimly above the ranks of the merciless horde. Along the track, a great procession of men, women, and children come towards you, some on horseback, some in carts, and some with bundles of possessions clutched to their soot-blackened chests. They stumble forward in silence, their eyes filled with terror and despair. A soldier, bleeding from a wound to his head, rides past the crest, shouting, Turn back! Turn back! THE ARMIES OF DARKNESS ARE COMING! And here's a picture of the, uh... You can see some of the fleeing refugees. You can see the soldier. He's got his head wound. Some birds. I guess this is rain. Or maybe there's some higher birds that are just, like, shitting heavily down. I don't know. This horse doesn't look like it's enjoying its life. Of course, kind of looks like it's assuming the position to take a shit, too. I'm probably reading some stuff into this picture that's not intended. Pretty cool. Cool illustration, though. Let me adjust my microphone stand into a new position. Okay. It is impossible to continue along the track northwards. The dirt road is blocked with refugees from Siata, and the Ogian Horde are poised to launch an attack from the hills. Only two courses of action are left open to you. You can turn back along the track, or you can ride west, across the hills toward the Mordril Forest. Consult the map before making your decision. Turn back. Ride west across the hills. Let's take a look at the map. Let me get rid of that cover. There's Ogia up here. Alright, we were coming from Tharo towards Siata. We can cut west into the Mordral Forest, which will take us directly towards the Dinar, or we can go back towards Tharo. But going back towards Tharo doesn't make any sense. Plus, who was it that we talked to that told us we needed to go through the Mordral Forest? It was somebody that told us to do that. Somebody that I think we trusted. So, we're going through the forest. That's what we're gonna do. Cover, come back. At my bidding. Ride west. You and Pido wheel your horses around and follow the crest of the ridge. Expertly, you manage to steer them down a steep bank of loose shale, and then on at a brisk pace along a dried out gully. Soon, the gully becomes a stream of sparkling water, fed by an underground spring. 
A rumble like the sound of a distant storm warns you that the vast army of Zegrun, war chief of Ogia, is now less than 20 miles away. And there's the black wolf head banner of Ogia. You follow the stream until it enters a long corridor of towering trees that descend towards the bank of a swift flowing brook, a tributary of the river Siad. You stop here briefly to bathe your faces in the icy water and to stare at the mass of blue-green giant trees that fill the western horizon. This sounds like a cool forest. There's a random picture of a sword with some vines wrapped around it. The Mordrill Forest, says Pido, a note of trepidation in his voice. It was once a wondrous forest, a place of light and goodness. The trees grew strong, and the birds and beasts were the fairest of any forest breed. But the Mordrill has grown dark and dismal of late. The Danarga encroaches, feeding its sickness to the soil and poisoning the saplings and the creatures that dwell there still. It is a doomed forest, doomed to become part of the Danarg Swamp. Well, that's a grim note, Pido. Hey, Enigma Soul. Here you come to save the day, which largely involves being entirely too damn distraction, distracting and sidetracking you on tangents. Yes. Well, I don't mind that. I don't mind that. I'm pretty tangenty myself anyway. You've missed some tangents already during this, this session. The book did ask for curing, and in fact, I used curing not only to save my own life, but to save Pido as well, after we both ate some poisoned stew. So, I did get to use curing, and uh, it, was, it was well worth it. Yep. I got killed twice in combat by the same boss. And I also died once of instant death because I tried to talk to a miner in a mine and he blew- he decapitated me with his musket. It was really not good. It was- I've already died three times in this book. You remount your horse and cross the brook. As you climb the opposite bank, you notice a set of freshly made tracks in the soft earth. Do I have patsmanship? You bet I do. What am I, some primate that doesn't have patsmanship? I'm a tutelary now. Actually, I've had passmanship ever since I was a Kai Master Superior or whatever scrub-ass rank you start the Magna Kai books as. At first, you think that the tracks are those of a black bear, the paw prints being of a similar size and depth, but a closer examination changes your mind. These prints were left by a biped, a two-footed animal that walks upright. You have never before come across tracks like these, and judging from the size of the prints, you would be happier to avoid the creature that made them. We found the tracks of a circus bear! It's clearly a circus bear, walking upright on two feet. It's probably like balancing a ball on its nose or something. You urge your horse up the steep bank and across the fallen branches that litter the trail beyond. Less than a mile from the brook, you hear the sound of rushing water. The track bears north. It bears north? Really? Huh? You know what else bears north? That circus bear we just saw. And you see a roaring waterfall cascading into a rocky pool, its surface lost in a cloud of fine spray. A huge tree has fallen across the pool, creating a bridge, and the track leads straight to it. You are halfway across the tree bridge, looking down at the swirling spray and foaming water below, when a ghastly howl rings out above the thunder of the waterfall. You look up and stare slack-jawed at the creature that is advancing towards you across the tree bridge. Is it a crazy angry circus bear? We'll find out. Whoa, that's way worse than a circus bear. Way worse. The creature gives a strange, snickering cry as slowly it edges nearer and nearer. It is a huge, pear-shaped beast with a hunched back and a white lizard-like head. Awkwardly, it shuffles upright on two large, hairy paws. At first glance, it looks as if two totally separate creatures have been joined together at the waist, 
The lower half is covered with a coarse spiky fur, and the upper body is pale and hairless, heavily veined, with long sinewy forearms. It raises its snout to savor the smell of your frightened horse, and opens its fanged jaws. Alright, I'm officially not feeling this creature. This does not look like something that you ever- look at that tongue. What the shit? Look at those claws. Look at those horns. Look at its just overall uhness. Yeah, we're gonna have to slay this thing. Good thing I'm a tutelary. If I was just a primate, I'd probably be doomed here. If only I had my towel. If you have a bow and wish to use it. If you have a towel and wish to use it. No, I don't have a towel. Yeah, I think creatures like this uh, pretty much warrant using an arrow. So I'm going to shoot my bow at this thing. Your horse is panic-stricken. The tree bridge is too narrow for it to turn around, and Pido's mount is so close behind that you are unable to back up without risk of sending them both over the edge. Pick a random number. If you completed the lower circles of fire and light, add three. I have not completed either of those lower circles. Thank you. Oh, uh, so I need to get an eight. I need to roll an eight or a nine. That's a 20% chance of that happening. Here we go. Nope! <laughs> my arrow is going to avail me nothing. Let me just mark my arrow off now. Okay, let's see what terrible thing happens. The arrow misses its mark by several yards. By several yards? How bad do you have to be to... I mean... By several yards? What the fuck? I would have to just be aiming literally like in some other completely different direction than the thing. <laughs> That's a terrible shot. I did lose the archery contest, if you remember. Anybody that watched me do book six, I lost, I lost that archery contest and it was very embarrassing. Alright, the arrow misses by several yards. Streaking into the forest behind the creature. There is no time for a second shot. You shoulder your bow, in shame, and make ready to draw a hand weapon as the beast closes in to attack. Oh boy, here we go. The slimy stench of the creature drives your horse wild with fear, forcing you to dismount and advance along the tree bridge to meet it. Suddenly there is a fearful cry as your panic-stricken horse careers backwards into Pido's mount. He fights to keep control of his own frightened horse, but the panic is infectious and, with a crack of splintering wood, their stamping hooves split the edge of the tree bridge. You watch with horror as both horses fall headlong into the watery abyss. Pido leaps from his mount as it falls, grabbing hold of the edge of the splintered wood, but it is wet and you can see his fingers slipping. Instinctively, you move to save him, but the stinging lash of a clawed paw reminds you of the creature you must face first. Fucking Pido, he's always got some excuse not to help me in battle. Like, he's always in some kind of other peril or whatever when the battle starts so that I always have to fight everything on my own. It's an anafeg, apparently. Alright, sure it is. There's a lot of endurance. This creature is immune to Mind Blast, but not Psy Surge again. They're mocking me with the Psy Surge thing. Every damn time they say that, like, hey, guess what? Cool people would have Psy Surge here. Unless you have the Magnakai Discipline of Psy Screen, reduce your combat skill by two points for the duration of the combat, for the creature is also attacking you with the power of its mind. Of course it's also Psychic, you know? Because that's legit. That looks like the kind of thing... Wow, how many... That looks like the kind of thing that's also psychic, right? I mean, what? What? What's happening to me here? Alright, let's do this. Fortunately... Oh, I have to reduce my combat skill by two. Fortunately, it, it has pretty shitty combat skill. 
All right, let's do this. Round one. I lost two. It lost 11. Not bad. Not bad. Round two. I lost zero. It lost eight. I'm feeling that. Round three. I lost zero. It lost 16. That was a good round for me. Round four should kill it. And yeah, and it didn't even hurt me that round at all, and it's dead. All right, that went well. I barely even got hurt. Fuck you, Anna Feg. Your bark is worse than your bite, or whatever. All right, I won. Let's keep healing here. The foul creature howls its death cry and topples over the edge. Before it is out of sight, you turn and run along the tree bridge, your hand outstretched to grab Pido's arm. Just in time, you save him. A moment later, and he would have joined the Anafeg and plummeted into the spray-filled pool. And there's the nasty claw of the Anafeg sinking into the water. You can tell it's psychic because it's fat. Clearly it uses telekinesis for all physical labor. Right? I mean, that's just logical. That's just science right there. Science. For a few minutes, you stare silently at the pool below. Nothing stirs in the seething waters to record the loss of your horses or the passing of the dreadful Anafeg. All three have disappeared without trace. The distant thunder of battle pervades your thoughts, prompting you to leave the tree bridge and move deeper into the Mordral forest. The tall trees become denser, often forcing you to turn your body sideways in order to make any progress. Gradually, dense undergrowth turns to a carpet of moss and blue-black lichen, which clings to your boots like mud. A chill overwhelms you as a thick and pearly mist seeps from the cracks beneath the trees. The many sounds of the forest have disappeared to be replaced by a cold and eerie silence. So, the, uh... The forest is getting creepy. If you could move things with your mind, you'd be lazy too, Enigma Soul. Yeah, oh, I would be. In real life, hell yeah. I would, like be the laziest person ever if I could move things with my mind. Lone Wolf can move things with his mind. He has mind over matter. Which I've used a few times in the older books, but I haven't used in a long time in the newer books. But, uh, you know. I'm not in need of tincture of Oxidine or of Eat her Herb. I haven't gotten any cotton? Wow! Some solid English right there. I haven't cotton any diseases. What the fuck did I just say? I haven't caught any diseases that I know of. Let's keep healing. Twilight is approaching. Ah, a bad book is coming at us. As the sky above darkens, a black bird flies among the upper branches, emitting a shrill cry, which sounds unnaturally loud in the silent forest. It settles, stares at you for a few minutes, and then flaps away. A little later, you stumble upon a clearing. Shafts of ghostly moonlight pour through a gap in the black canopy of leaves, revealing a mound of earth rising out of the forest mist. We were both exhausted after the day's events, and agree to stop here to rest. Pido takes a gold crown from his pocket and tosses it in the air to decide who should take the first watch. Heads or tails? He asks, the crown clenched in his fist. <laughs> what, a, what a fucking trivial ass you reason to use divination. I wouldn't use divination before eating the poison stew, but I'll use it for this. Come on, come on, lone wolf. Well, of course I'm gonna use divination. I mean, if I had divination, I would constantly be fucking cheating on, like, coin tosses and stuff. Enigma Soul says, Indeed, the precision of your verbal elocution is unparalleled in its distinction, good sir. Thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. 
Using your Kai skill, you find it easy to detect that the coin shows heads. Of course I'm going to call heads because I'm a cheeky bastard. Paido reveals the coin you have chosen correctly. You decide to take the second watch and settle yourself down for some much needed rest. The gray earth is soft and spongy and provides an excellent mattress. You pull your warm Kai cloak around your shoulders and slip into a deep, dreamless sleep. Restore three endurance points. All right. That'll top me back off. I was down to five at one point after that really hard fight that killed me twice. Four hours later, you take over the watch. Your vigil passes uneventfully. And as the darkness of night gives way to the gloomy gray of dawn, you wake your companion and prepare to set off once more. Your sense of time slips away as you trek through the seemingly endless expanse of bleak gray trees. Slowly you become aware that you are on an incline, and as your passage becomes steeper, you notice large outcrops of pitted volcanic rock. We're approaching the Danarg crater says Pido, his quietly spoken words echoing loudly through the eerie forest. Suddenly you recall the words of Lord Ramoa during your period of preparation in Elzion. The Danarg occupies the crater of an ancient and massive volcano. Once it was a lush jungle of fertile vegetation, but now it is a cancerous wound that poisons all who dwell there. Sounds like a nice place. By noon, you have climbed to the lip of the crater and begun your descent. Gradually, the tall, straight trees of the Mordral Forest thin out, giving way to twisted trunks and stunted saplings as the land sinks deeper and deeper. Imperceptibly, the forest ends and the swamp begins. It sounds like it's pretty perceptibly, actually. The trees, the, the normal straight trees are thinning out and giving way to, you, like... The sentence right before this tells us that it's perceptible. I'm just saying. Imperceptibly, the forest ends and the swamp begins. The ground is softer, and tall black rushes appear in clumps around misty pools of stagnant water. From tortured husks of trees hang thorny vines, as tough and as cruel as sharpened steel wire. So thickly are they entwined around some trees that they have strangled them, leaving empty coils where the trunks have rotted away. The stench of decay fills your nostrils in the humid yet cold air. You wade through ankle-deep slime for nearly an hour before reaching the edge of a huge murky pool. Whirls and eddies disturb its surface, warning of the creatures that lurk below. I do have paths on the ship, and I've reached the rank of tutelary. Thank you very much. No mere primate am I. Let's passmanship it up. Your improved Kai skill warns you that to the north, a tribe of hungry swamp creatures are lurking at the edge of the pool in search of prey. You and Pido would provide an excellent meal for these beasts. To the south, the track takes you away from the heart of the swamp, and consequently, further away from your goal. And Enigma Soul says, Lone Wolf can perceive perceptible paths and patterns, but can he see why kids love Cinnamon Toast Crunch? <laughs> Anyone can see why kids love Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Cinnamon Toast Crunch is awesome. If you've ever tried Cinnamon Toast Crunch, it doesn't have to be explained to you. You know. You know. It's like cinnamon toast in the form of cereal. What sorcery is this? Okay, so we can go north and brave some swamp creatures that are lurking, or we can go south, which is away from the direction we need to go. Well, we don't go away from the direction we need to go, wading through fucking slime. We're gonna go chop up some swamp creatures, is what's gonna happen here. The withered trees are grouped more densely around the northern edge of the pool. A ceiling of vines crisscrosses above your head, and creatures slither against your ankles as you wade through the foul-smelling mud. Progress is very slow. Random horned skull just chillin'. 
Suddenly, fearful screams like the baying of rabid dogs sound from the mist-enshrouded trees ahead. A host of creeping creatures, each an arm's length taller than a man, rise from their hiding places. Black water drips from their corpse-green hides, and their toad-like faces betray their evil intent as they slither and shuffle towards you. I'm glad to know that Lone Wolf is able to read, like, micro-expressions on things that have faces like toads. Like, oh yeah, that's a classic toad face look of evil intent right there. You see the way the, uh... <laughs> The giant bulbous toad eyes kind of constrict at the... Yeah, that's obviously evil intent. I can use a bow. I can use a fire seed. Or I can just throw down. Uh, I never use fire seeds. I might as well just use one. Fuck it. I'll throw a fire seed and see what happens. Snatching the seed from your pocket, you throw it with all your strength at a crawling lizard beast that is slithering towards you on its belly. You watch with dismay as the fire seed bounces off its soft, fibroid skull and plops harmlessly into the mire. Remember to tick this lost fire seed off your auction chart. God damn it. Well, whatever. I had three and I never really use them, so might as well. Cursing your luck. You unsheath your weapon as the creature rears up to attack. Whoa. You are faced by a monstrous reptile. Its webbed, claw-tipped hands are poised to rend you in two. Okay, hold on, Joe. Wait. Isn't this thing based on a toad? Isn't it toad-like? Toads are amphibians. They're not reptiles. What kind of weird toad-like reptile creature is this? It's, like, completely distorting all rules of biology. It's confusing me. It's also... It really doesn't look that scary. It looks like it's just misunderstood. You know? It just wants to be friends. Look at it. It's just... Look at its face. It's just lonely. It's just sad. It just wants a friend. Them some claws, though. Alright, I'm about to beat up a depressed amphibian reptile named Zlorg. Great. You cannot evade combat and must fight the creature to the death. It wants to rend me in two. That's just how it shows love. Okay, that's how it was raised. In its family, rending something in two was, was how you experience intimacy. And here I am, and I'm... Well... I guess I just have to meet it where it is, you know? I have to I have to take it on its own terms, in which case I need to rend it into to show it, you know, that we're cool. Let's do this fight. I'm going to use Mind Blast on it too because it doesn't say I can't. Did you seriously just... <laughs> <laughs> Rewrite the lyrics to Behind Blue Eyes by The Who? Did you just do that right now, Enigma Soul? No one knows what it's like to be the bad toad. To be the sad toad with bulbous eyes. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. You have no idea what you're talking about? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. All right, Zlorg. Let's do this little song and dance. Round one. Oof. I feel bad. I almost feel bad for Zlorg. I just chopped 18 points off of it and didn't even get touched in response. Round two. All right, I let it, I let it touch me a little bit. Took another 10. Here we go. And it scra scratched me a little bit more, and I killed it. I rend it in two, according to the customs of its people. <laughs> With bulbous eyes, that's amazing. It would be so good to rewrite that whole song. <laughs> like that. Oh, boy. Okay. 
I just tootalized that thing. You just got tootled, son. Because I'm a tootalary. Oh, I gotta fight some more right here. We're, we're not done. You leap over the twitching body of this lorg and help Pido, who is being forced perilous, perilously close to the pool's edge by three more of the growling swamp creatures. You strike from behind, breaking the back of one with your downstroke and opening the side of another as you swing your weapon clear. Pido falls, clutching an arm deeply torn by needle-sharp talons. His attacker turns on you, darting its head towards your throat with a lightning speed. I don't think you really understand how fast lightning is, Joe. I don't think it really went with lightning speed. And we're going to understand you're being poetic here, but come on, lightning? Lightning is fucking fast. If this thing really moved as fast as actual lightning, it would kick our ass. It would be like the Flash. Its jaws gape wide as it lashes out with a sticky tongue, spraying your eyes with stinging saliva. That's not very sporting. Instinctively, you bend forward, your hands wiping the spittle from your face, a reflex action which saves you from the creature's grip as it leaps forward to strangle you. Suddenly, it lets out a gurgling croak and falls backward with a thick splash. Falls forward with a thick splash. You stagger back and open your bloodshot eyes to see it lying face down in the mire with Pido's dagger embedded in its back. Look out! Screams your companion as the last of the Zlorg attacks you from behind. Gotta fight another Zlorg real quick. Unless you possess the Magnakai discipline of Hunt Mastery, reduce your combat skill by four points for the duration of this combat. Of course I have Hunt Mastery. I've had Hunt Mastery since I was a lowly primate. Strangle you? Now that's just rude. Why wouldn't it rend you into like a perfectly polite little Zlorg? I know, right? That's just... It's trying to it's trying to branch out and do things that like other cultures do. It's it's just experimenting. It's going through an awkward phase in its life right now. Okay. How about we have this battle? How does that sound? Of course I have hunt mastery, so I'm not going to mess around with that. Let's do this, Lorg. Mind blast. Let's do it. I wrecked it up. Wrecked it up for 18. Took no damage myself. Round 2. Took no damage myself. Killed it. Man, I'm a Zorg Slayer. Once you've killed one Zlorg, really after that, they're really no big deal. You killed one Zlorg, you've killed them all, pretty much. The Zlorg gurgles its last breath and falls dead, writhing briefly in the mud before coming still with an uncanny eruptness. Whoa. Writhing briefly in the mud before becoming still with an uncanny abruptness. You turn to Pido and drag him away from the pool's edge, where his bleeding arm is attracting a crawling horde of hungry leeches. You leave the pool and press on along the muddy trail, glancing back once. No sign remains of the dead Zlorg. Their bodies have already been claimed by the creatures of the pool. Dibs! You hear one of the creatures of the pool say. You tend to Pido's wound, using your basic Kai knowledge of healing to prevent an infection from taking hold, before continuing deeper in the swamp. The ankle-deep ooze that borders the pool gives way to firmer ground, and you arrive shortly at a place where a tree bearing blood-red fruit overhangs a pool of clear water. You stop here to rest and dislodge the tiny leeches that are feasting on your legs. Pido climbs the tree to scan the horizon. He carries with him a star guider, a homing device invented by the Elder Magi to enable their flying ships to navigate in the dark. It is sensitive to the vibrations of corlinium crystals. The spire of the Temple of Orido is solid corlinium, and the Elder Magi have set Pido's scar Star Guider to home in on the vibrations emitted by the spire. By following the direction of these vibrations, you should find the Lost Temple. While Pido is busy adjusting the Star Guider, you decide to take a closer look at your surroundings. Examine the red fruit. 
Examine the clear pool. Well, the clear pool sounds suspect as shit, considering how everything else has been in this place. It's probably some kind of, like, acid pool. Let's check out this red fruit. I've already been, like, severely poisoned once in this book. Why not get poisoned again? The red-skinned fruit is the size of an orange, and its peel is similar in texture to an orange peel. I have Hunt Mastery. Let's check it out. Your Magna Chi discipline reveals to your experienced eye that these fruits are not what they appear. Shocker. The tree is dead and incapable of producing fruit. They are carnivorous animals that have taken on the outward appearance of juicy, ripe fruits in order to snare the unwary. Uh, I'm gonna attack... <laughs> is that Peaches by Presidents of the United States of America? Is that who it was by? I think it was. Millions of leeches. Leeches are free. Millions of leeches. Leeches on me. Millions of leeches. The leeches are free. Millions of leeches. Leeches on me. Look out. Leeches come in a can. They were put there by a man. Roaming through the jungle. Gonna get me a lot of leeches. <laughs> uh, see, if I didn't know the songs you were referencing, your comments in chat would make no sense to me. And I'd be like, what is she talking about? But since I recognize the songs... It's really funny. I'm going to attack a fruit because that's that's where my life has come to. This is what my life has become. I'm I, I'm going to question my life choices later. But right now, I'm attacking some fucking fruit. I'm about to fruit ninja it up in here. Die, fruit! Your first blow smashes the soft fruit to a pulp. At this, the other fruits drop from the trees, springing open as they hit the ground. Long, thin, fleshy legs emerge from their squat bodies and they scuttle away in the, into the surrounding marsh at an alarming speed. This is like Wonderland or something. I feel like I'm going to meet the Cheshire Cat any second. When Pino climbs down from the tree, he looks at you like, Why the fuck are you attacking fruit? When F Pido finally climbs down from the tree, his face betrays his anxiety. What is wrong? You ask impatiently. There is no signal, he replies. I have scanned every direction with the Star Guider, but they can detect no Corlinium signal. It isn't damaged, of that I'm sure. It's simply as if the temple has disappeared. You take the device from Pido's hand and climb the twisted tree trunk. He shouts instructions and you set the Star Guider into operation, scanning the distant horizon and waiting for the telltale click that will reveal the direction of the lost temple of the Elder Magi. But Pido is right. There is no signal. And without a signal, there is no hope of finding the lore stone of Erido. Fucking, I, I, I don't have any bars. I don't have any bars. We got no cell reception out here in this fucking jungle. Damn it. There's just no cell coverage out here. I knew we shouldn't have picked AT&T for our Star Guider coverage. Hey, Pido, have you tried phase modulating the deflector shields to a new frequency? See, now, now we're just getting way too sci-fi. Okay. You are about to abandon the search and jump down from the tree when you see something on the northern horizon that you hadn't noticed before. An island of red volcanic rock rises out of the mire. One of four flat-topped islands grouped in a diamond close to the eastern edge of the crater. Perhaps the temple is on the other side of that island. Perhaps that is why the Star Guider will emit no signal. Yeah, that seems like something you would notice. You climb down and ask Pida what he thinks. He stares to the north and ponders the problem. Yes, it is possible, he says thoughtfully. It is just possible. I mean, what else are we going to do? Besides kill some more fruit. Hope returns and your spirits rise with the expectation of finding the lost temple beyond the Isle of Red Rock. You set off without delay, anxious to cover the 10-mile trek before the sun sets and darkness engulfs the Denarg. 
For the most part, the swamp mire is firm underfoot, and the inhabitants pose no problems that cannot be solved by a few shouts or well-placed weapon blows. But, as the sky darkens and you draw nearer to the plateau, the going becomes more difficult. A carpet of vines, thick with mold, covers a surface of muddy holes and hollows. Often, a seeming puddle proves to be a bottomless fissure. Progress becomes so slow that you fear you will never reach the island before dark. Yeah, this is going well. Maybe we'll find some helpful monks that will help us. There's been two separate monasteries I've met in this book so far, and both of them were filled with evil people that tried to kill me. Pido is leading the way across a tangled mat of barbed vines when a wave disturbs the muddy ooze below. Suddenly, the great head of a silver swamp python bursts through the rotting creepers and raises its tree-thick coils high in the air. Awesome jaws set with double-tiered fangs tower above you, glistening in the fading light. A drop of venom falls from the fangs and sets the quagmire boiling. Well, that is a hell of a snake. Wow. It's got venom that boils the quagmire. What the shit? Alright, well, I'm partial to snakes. The last time I met a huge giant snake of craziness, I one-shotted the fucking thing, so... Let's see what happens this time. I do not have animal control. I used to be a primate, though. I'm an ex-primate. I don't have this skill. Oh, now you're riffing off of my mention of Wonderland, huh? Yeah, Jabberwocky. Lewis Carroll. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the Jub-Jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in a fish thought he stood, the Jabberwock, with eyes aflame, came whiffling through the tulgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head, he went galumphing back. I know all the rest of it too, but I think I should stop. The great snake flicks its tongue and lunges forward, intent on consuming you both in its massive jaws. A silver swamp python. Dun dun dun. Thing has a lot of endurance. Owing to the swiftness of its attack, you do not have time to use a bow. Unless you possess the Magna Chi discipline of curing. Yeah, motherfucker! Curing! Curing! Curing in the house! I got so much curing. Hashtag all curing all the time. And I've reached the rank of primate. I've blown past the rank of primate. I look back on the past and I, and I reminisce about the, the halcyon days of being a primate. Double all endurance point losses you sustain during the combat due to the snake's venomous bite. Galump is your favorite word invented by Lewis. Man, he invented so many great words. It means to lurch forward awkwardly as if carrying a heavy load. That's pretty much how I just walk, I think. I just galump all the time. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm galumphing. Galump your ass over here. Alright, let's fight this fucking python. First things first. Get you some Mind Blast. Boom. Second thing, second. Let's kill this thing. It has a lot of endurance, but I'm not concerned. I'm plus 10 up on it, so... 35 and 60. That's now 35 and 44. It's 16 to it in the first round. It didn't touch me. You know you can't mess with me, snakes. 35, 44. Wait, have we reached the cover art? 
guy in the cover art, the lone wolf is fighting a big snake, but he's also got some sort of crazy demon creature, and that snake on the cover also is not silver, and also it's not really as big as the snake. We're, I don't know, I don't know. I don't think we've re officially reached the cover art. Thirty-five, forty-four. I lost two. It lost twelve. Next round. I lost none. It lost sixteen. This is a significantly bigger snake. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That that's that little constrictor snake on the cover is not even. That thing ain't no silver swamp python. 3316, 32 and 12. So it's damaging me a tiny bit, but pretty much I'm kicking its ass. And it hurt me for three with its last two points of endurance. Got one last little bite in. That's fine. I'm doing fine. I'm a tutelary. Didn't you know that, silver swamp python? You probably didn't know I was a tutelary when you attacked me. You thought I was probably just a primate, but you were wrong. All right, victory. The arrival of the swamp python frightened away the crawling denizens of the mire, but now they are returning to satisfy their curiosity. Hordes of slithering lizard beasts gather at the edge of the floating morass, inching their way nearer as they assess your strengths and weaknesses. Relentlessly, you push your way through the soggy vegetation until you reach the jagged rock wall of the island, urged on all the way by a hissing chorus of swamp creatures. Enigma Soul says, Man, you can't go a single book without running into relatives, can you, Snake? I know, right? There's been a lot of snakes lately, the last few books. Before that, there wasn't really. Long streamers of moss-covered vines hang down the red rock wall in huge numbers, inviting you to climb onto the plateau above. After the uncertain ground of the swamp, the hard, jagged rock is a welcome relief. You make good progress, reaching the top just as the sun is sinking into a sea of scarlet mist that shrouds the eastern Denarg. In the failing light, you discover a trail that winds northwards through the knee-high foliage. Pathsmanship again, that, that, that ability always delivers. It really does. That's why it was one of the first three I picked. Passmanship and divination. You always gotta take you always gotta take those first because they get used all the damn time. Even in the failing light, you can see that this trail is frequently used. The spongy vegetation is crushed flat, and a profusion of tracks are imprinted on the loamy soil. The tracks were made by man-sized creatures, barefooted and web-toed. Close to the main trail winds another, less obvious track. For some reason, someone or something has gone to great lengths to keep this trail secret. And I... I shall take the road less traveled. I'm gonna stay frosty and follow the secret trail. See what I did there. A full moon and a cloudless sky make your passage along this secret path much easier. It follows a torturous route through the tall plants, around mossy mounds full of crawling insects, past the dark entrances to underground warrens, and skirts the fringe of a thicket of trees. Pido halts and crouches down, ignoring the bloated spiders that scuttle around his knees, and points through a gap in the trees to a settlement of crudely made huts. Dark shapes move between them, human once, but far from human now. Gagrim! whispers Pido, with fear in his voice. The man-beasts of the Danarg! In the distant past, the Gagrim were a gentle, primitive folk, who lived as one with the animals and the birds, cared for by the Elder Magi in their jungle paradise. But the Danarg has changed, and so too have the Gagrim, poisoned by the evil that has conquered the land. Well, maybe they'll be friendly, let's just walk up to them. Really, the smart thing to do is avoid the Gogrim, but do I do the smart thing or do I do the interesting thing? I think we know the answer to that. Stealthily, you approach the huts, using your Kai hunting skills to muffle the sound of your passage through the foliage. Unfortunately, Pido is unused to such woodcraft. He fails to see a clutch of dried twigs on the ground before him, and they crack loudly under his foot. 
You freeze in your tracks, your eyes fixed on the huts ahead. Swiftly and silently, they leave their huts, creeping like cats stalking their prey. They move on two legs, although they appear better suited to loping on all fours. You turn and run for all you are worth, but this is their territory and they know every fold in the ground. Swiftly, they gain on you, forcing you to stand and fight. Oh, Fire Seed worked out so well the last time. Let's use another Fire Seed, because I want to see something good happen as a result of a Fire Seed, for once. The Fire Seed bursts into flames, blinding your pursuers with its sudden glare. You seize the opportunity to dive into th the thick undergrowth that borders the track. Pido follows as you crawl towards the cover of the trees. The hysterical howls of the Gagrim fill the night as you scramble through the foliage. By chance, you stumble onto a track that skirts around the edge of the encampment and disappears to the north. It seems to be deserted. Uh, we will follow the track and not rush into the undergrowth. An hour passes and you breathe a sigh of relief, glad to have left the Gagrim settlement far behind. You forego a rest and press on along the track until you reach a promontory of rock on the northwestern tip of the island. There you stop and snatch a few hours sleep while you wait for the dawn. Day breaks and the view it brings fills you with awe. Perched on this rocky peak, you can see the sheer vastness of the swamp in all its frightening glory for the first time. Pido activates the Star Guider and scans the horizon. Is he going to get some bars now? <laughs> can we get some bars? But even before its telltale clicks are heard, your eagle eyes have spotted the glint of the temple's Corlinium Sphere. Corlinium Spire. To the west, beyond a sea of sickly green-black vegetation, stands the Temple of Orido, imprisoned but unaffected by the swamp. The howl of the Gagrim echoes across the island as you make your descent, by rope and vine, to the wetlands below. You reach the rocky base and set off across the mud flats, following the Star Guider's signal now that the spire is hidden by swamp mist. Pick a random number to see whether or not you get screwed. I got a four. All right, let's see what that does to me. Around a pool of slimy water are gathered a group of vine coils, hollow and funnel-shaped like gigantic rusty springs. They support a huge spider's web. Nope, nope, so much nope. There is no sign of the web's maker, although, judging by the size of the rope-like strands, it must be a creature of enormous size, going back, turning around. You give the pool a wide berth before finding your way back to where the Star Guider's signal is strongest. A creeping bank of mist rolls across your path, and the maker of the web looms out of it. Pido stifles a cry as this hairy abomination scuttles towards you, its venomous maw poised to bite. So there is the lovely giant swamp spider with venom dripping off of its fangs or mandibles or whatever the hell you call these things. It's got some fucked up looking eyes. Just because it's evil fantasy spider, it's got horns too. Well, I think trying to evade it will be not very efficacious. So we're going to stand and bang. All right, I don't think I know what what song you're you're doing this time, Enigma. Some say the snake will kill with fire, others say with ice. As his name, it seems vaguely familiar, but I I don't know it for sure. As his name leaves no need to inquire, I'll hold with those who favor fire. But should he have to slaughter twice, I hope he'll know that despite that name, a frozen wrath is also nice and just as suited to causing pain. Robert Frost, Fire and Ice. Oh. Nice. Because I made a Robert Frost reference earlier. So it's not a song, it's a poem. You got me with that one. Alright, let's fight this big spider. 
The gigantic spider closes in for the kill, its fangs dripping with sticky black venom, and its coal black eyes glinting greedily as it savors your scent. That's the original text of the, the poem. See, I know I've read that before. Now that I'm reading it, definitely I've read it before, but I still wouldn't have been able to identify it. I have a bow and wish to use it, yes. Yes, I do. Waiting until the last possible moment. You release your arrow, sending it burrowing deep into the creature's eye. It roars with pain, its legs scrabbling the mud as it sways and then crashes down with a mighty splash. You do not wait to see if your shot proves fatal, but shoulder your bow immediately and follow Pido as he picks up the signal from the temple spire. You have way too many poems and songs and such memorized. You're an endless fountain of useless trivia. Yeah, useless trivia is the best kind, though. After your encounter with the Tawn Spider, you are both in need of a rest. Didn't we just get up? You stop to recover your strength. You must eat a meal or lose three endurance points. Hunt mastery. Suck it. Pido is optimistic that you will reach the temple by sundown if you can avoid encountering any more of the Denarg's hostile inhabitants. Well, that doesn't seem likely. The whole place is filled with monsters and shit. It is late afternoon when you see the Temple of Arido rising majestically out of the swamp mists and tangled vegetation. The sight of this towering ziggurat is so breathtaking that you are both stunned into silence as you feast your eyes on its untarnished splendor. Tier upon tier of gleaming white stone, shaped and formed into perfect symmetry, confront you. Huge foundation slabs support a level carved of golden rock, inlaid and decorated with gemstones. Above that sit strata of precious metals, and then levels made up of crystal slabs whose facets refract the colors of the rainbow. Upward climb tiers of ruby, sapphire, and emerald, that offer up a wedge-shaped spire of pure corlinium crystal to the sky. This place sounds like it's worth a shitload of money. Like, these people that built this, these elder magi or whatever, these people, they had some wealth. I wonder how many, how many, like, millions of slaves that had to live in abject poverty and degradation in order for them to build this thing. Of course, they were a whole race of, like, mages, so I guess they could have just used magic to do it. That's probably the more likely scenario. Blah blah blah, magic did it. At its base, the swamp has shrunk back as if repelled by the radiant goodness of the temple. A perimeter of lush grass leads to a staircase of solid amber. You follow Pido as he ascends toward the pair of huge triangular doors set into the second level. Everywhere, the glitter of gemstones and the gleam of precious metals radiate a purity unspoiled by the Denarg. Pido completes the complex procedures that open the great doors, taught to him by the Elder Magi in preparation for this mission. They part, and you enter, stepping on a floor of glistening gold, a floor that has lain undisturbed for 7,000 years. So they built this place to last. The great doors close with a whisper. You follow Pido along a corridor of gleaming silvery metal that dazzles your eyes to a hall carved from solid crystal. Icicles of diamond hang from its ceiling and reflect in a floor set with mosaics of a thousand shimmering squares. Approach the crystal dais, lone wolf, instructs Pido, pointing to a radiant circular plateau of pure quartz. But even as his words leave his lips, you are already walking toward the plinth, drawn by a strange compulsion. You mount the dais, and a flood of golden light pours down from above, bathing you in its warm, cleansing rays. You raise your cupped hands, as if offering up an invisible gift, and a tingling sensation runs the length of your arms and spreads through your body, giving you an incredible sense of well-being. 
A ball of sparkling light is taking shape in your hands. It condenses into a radiant crystal filled with golden fire. It is the lore stone of Orido. All of this is way too shiny and pure and happy and warm and bright. Something incredibly horrible is about to happen. There's the image with the crystals and the shining... Strange shaped object. The shining lozenge of Orido. Oh, you get all your endurance back here. That's pretty great. Full heal. I mean, I didn't need it, but it's still nice. It's the thought that counts. It's better than a gift card. The light fades and you step down from the dais, your senses aglow with a newfound wisdom and strength. Having witnessed the fulfillment of your quest, Pido beams with joy as you return to his side. He congratulates- Pido's about to fucking die. He congratulates you and bids you follow as he turns towards an archway of silver set into the crystal walls of the chamber. Come, Lone Wolf. We have a long journey ahead of us. We must leave without delay. The thought of returning to the dangers of the, D the Denarg fills you with dread. Pido senses your anxiety. Don't look so dismayed, he says, still, still smiling. This temple will provide the means for our safe return. You will see. Intrigued by his answer, you follow in silence as he leads you through the archway and up a long flight of marble stairs to another chamber, also constructed of crystal, but veined with a marble that glistens like liquid fire. It is solid corlinium. At the center of the chamber, its hull resting on a cradle of steel, is a levitron, an ancient skyship. Like everything else that you have seen in this wondrous temple, the craft is untarnished by time. Pido ushers you aboard and prepares to power the craft. A shudder runs through the hull as the engines rise in pitch and slowly it lifts from its bed of steel. The chamber is built in the spire of the temple, and the roof now slides open to allow the Levitron to rise into the darkening sky above the, the Denard. All of this is way too convenient. This is way too much good stuff happening at once. Oh, there just happens to be a skyship here for us to take home. No problem. I guess we're safe now. Wow, thank God the horrors of this journey are over. Everything's fine now. We win. No. No. I'm not fooled, Joe. I'm not fooled. Pido sets the controls and sets the ship's star guider on a course for Elzion. Then he joins you at the bow rail for one last look at the Temple of Orido. It glows red in the light of the setting sun, but the shimmering glow is blemished by shadows that swoop back and forth across its tiers. You assume it is just a trick of the twilight, until your ears are filled by a sudden and terrifying shriek. Yeah, knew it. If you could see my face right now, you would see a look of abject surprise on it. A utter shock. You look up to see a squadron of black-winged Kron swooping down on the Levitron. On the blacks of these on the blacks? On the backs of these leathery creatures ride red-robed Vordax, hideous, hideous servants of the Dark Lords of Helgadad. In their skeletal hands they wield staves of black iron, which crackle with blue fire. As a cron screams past, a stream of liquid blue flame pours from its rider's staff. Alright. Now I'm wary of of having too much hubris after the last time in this book when I was all like oh I've killed lots of these things this is easy I got no problem here and then I died but still I have killed some Vordax and a lot of Kron and a lot of things I mean, I mean I, we've been down this road before I'm not so concerned this is this is not my first Vordak and Kron rodeo so to speak and I do possess the Somer Sword, so let me just go ahead and ex absorb slash deflect that blue flame bullshit. You deflect the stream of liquid fire with the edge of your golden blade, sending it raining down into the Denarg. Two more Krons swoop in and hover above the prow. Their riders leap onto the deck and begin attacking part of the superstructure. Stop them! screams Pido, drawing his sword. Stop them or we're doomed! You leap from the bow and run across the main deck, your sun sword raised to strike. Got a couple of axe here. 
You must fight these creatures one at a time. They are immune to Mind Blast, but not Psy Surge. Every time it says that! Every time, they're like, you're not gonna use your ghetto-ass Mind Blast here. If you don't have Psy Surge, get the fuck out. Unless you possess the Magna Chi Discipline of Psy Screen again. This has happened like three times in this, in this book, where I get screwed over by not having Psy Screen also. Reduce your combat skill by two points for the duration of the combat. These creatures are undead. Oh, yeah, lol. Remember to double all endurance point losses they sustain due to the power of this Samra Sword. Alright, so I lose two off my combat skill. I can't use Mind Blast, but, and I have to fight them one at a time, but I'm still gonna wreck up on some fools because they take double damage from my awesome sword. So here we go. Round one. He lost 16, I lost two. Round two. I lost one, he died. First Vordak, dead. No probs. Second battle. This one's even weaker. Here we go. 32-26. Ha! One-shotted! Thanks for playing, Vordak! More like Vordead. More like poor Dak. I don't know. I'm just gonna stop now. Alright, so we killed a couple of Vordax. Let's roll on. Start the healing process. Suddenly, more shrieking Vordax crashed down on the deck. Pido is immediately engulfed by the red robed figures. He is outnumbered, but he fights with a tiger like tenacity, his blue bladed sword tearing deep into their loathsome bodies. You are running back across the main deck when a new danger confronts you. A Kron sweeps low across the skyship, dropping a cluster of black crystal cubes that scatter across the deck. That sounds bad. Alright, I don't have Psy Surge and Primate. Well, I have Primate, but I don't have Psy Surge. But I do have Divination, which always comes in handy. So I'm gonna Divinate some shit. Because that's a word. You sense that these cubes are set to explode. Should one of them cause a tear in the Levitron's pressure tank, the liquid gas stored inside will ignite, and the resulting explosion will tear the skyship to pieces. Alright, so we're on the Hindenburg, basically. They're about to blow our blimp up, is what's gonna happen. Alright, this is about to be a massive mess. How- Oh, I see what they're gonna do to me. If I gather up the cubes and throw them overboard, Pido's gonna die. And they're gonna be all like, Oh, Pido died because you didn't help him, it's your fault, just like when you let his brother die. Or I help him first, and these things blow up and our fucking ship goes down. Well, Pido's been... I mean, actually, he's not really been very useful ever, but he's been there with me, steadfast. You know? So I'm gonna try to save him, and... We'll get to the black cubes. I'm sure it'll be fine. Call Scotty in the engine room on your communicator and tell him you need more power from the Corlinium crystals. Yeah. Yeah, we're on a skyship, so now we have to start Star Trekking it up. Alright. Pido. No! Oh, Pido! It, it even said his, his tunic or whatever, his uniform is red and gold. He's a literal red shirt! No, Pido! Alright, I'm gonna help Pido first. Fuck it, those cubes will be fine. I'm sure nothing bad will happen. As you climb the steps to the prow, a Vordak lunges at your head with its black staff. You duck, and a splash of blue sparks showers your tunic as the tip of the staff shears through the metal handrail. You strike, driving your weapon into the creature's chest and sending it toppling backwards over the side. Insert Wilhelm scream. At the same time, a sudden blow strikes your shoulder, knocking you flat on your back. You are stunned and lose a grip of your weapon. You look up to see your attacker leaping from the top of the stairs, his clawed skeletal fingers hooked to rend your flesh. I've been rended before, just recently, in fact. I've been rended? I've been rent before. 
Vordak, you are now un unarmed. Oh, I see how they're doing me. This will be considerably more challenging without the summer sword. And they're getting me with this fucking side screen bullshit. And again, haha, -ha, you don't have side surge. Okay, I get it. I get it. The fact that I didn't take those is continuously fucking me. I understand. Thank you, book. If you win the combat against the Vordak, you are able to retrieve the weapon and keep it noted on your action chart. Yeah, yeah, I'm keeping the damn weapon. There's no question. I'll jump the fuck off the ship to get that thing back if I have to. Alright, here we go. First thing I need to do is... Oh, man. Unarmed. Hold on. I need to check something. No, it's not in that section. If you enter a combat with no weapons, deduct four points from your combat skill. So... I'm about to get worked because I don't have my sword which gives me eight and I don't have my weapon skill with my sword which gives me two more so this goes from 12 all the way down to two then I have to take four off for being unarmed and two off for his psychic attack so I have to take six more off of my base my combat skill is horrible now it's horrible wow this is gonna be ugly and it's not going to take double damage, because I'm not using the Samra Sword, and I can't use Mind Blast against it. Okay, this will go well. Remember a few minutes ago when I was all like, Oh, Vordax, I got this shit, whatever, lol. And I was, but I also said something about how I needed to be wary about hubris. Well, I did hubris again, and you can see what has resulted. I'm about to get my ass kicked. Okay, here we go. Actually, no, I can still win this fight, but I'm going to take some damage. Alright, here we go, round one. I lost five, it lost two. That's not great. Round two. Alright, that was good. It lost eight, I lost none. I rolled well there. Round three. Ooh, I rolled really well there. It lost nine and I lost none. Okay, I'm still be- I'm fucking punching the shit out of this Vordak. 29 is 7. Ooh, I lost 6. It lost 1. I did not roll well there. Okay, 23 and 6. I lost 4. It lost 4. So see, it's, it's kind of kicking my ass. I'm going to win, obviously, but it's hurting me pretty bad. 19 and 2. There we go. Yeah, it took me all the way down to 15 endurance as I had to, like, slowly punch that thing to death. <laughs> Okay, that was embarrassing. Let me get my sword back, please. So now that I get my sword back and everything, this goes back up to 15. This goes back up to 12. So I'm back up to my full. I won, though. That's what's important. One of the black crystal cubes lying on the deck suddenly explodes, sending a cloud of crystal shards screaming through the air. You were hit in the leg by this shrapnel. Lose three endurance points. Alright, so I'm going to lose three endurance, but I'm going to get one back because I get to heal this section. So I actually only lose two. So I'm down to 13. Ouch. I should use one of these potions. I'm going to. After the combat, heal four endurance. Alright. Alright. With horror, you realize that if one of these deadly cubes should puncture the Levitron's pressure tank, the skyship will be torn to pieces in the resulting explosion. Yeah, I knew that before. I just didn't care. If I help Pido first, again, this is... I'm going to get us blown up, aren't I? I'm going to get us blown up. I'm going to get us killed again. I've already died three times in this book. And I'm, I'm like aiming for death four right here. But I can't let leave Pido to his fate. I can't. What kind of a friend would I be? Ha! <laughs> Instant death. Told you. 
There is a terrific bang as another cube explodes. It is followed almost instantaneously by a massive explosion that transforms the Levitron into a colossal ball of flame as the liquid gas stored inside the pressure tank ignites. Your life and your quest end here. Okay. That was not the right decision. Four deaths for this book. Let's gather up the remaining crystals and throw them overboard. How does that sound? Frantically, you scramble across the deck, collecting and hurling away the cubes as you go. Each cube is vibrating with an energy that is set to rip it apart. And as you cast the last one over the side, you see the others, many of them exploding with dull booms in the swamp far below. Yeah. Cubes. I never liked cubism. Not at all, really. Nineteen. Pido screams for your help. A swooping cron rider has cast a large net, smothering his body. The net is sewn with hundreds of tiny barbed hooks, which have worked their way into his skin and clothes, and he cannot free himself without the hooks inflicting fearful wounds. Only one Vordak remains to confront him, all the others having perished on his blade, but he is now unable to defend himself against this creature. He is at the mercy of a merciless foe. Oh, I like that. I like what he did with that sentence. That's cute. You scramble to your feet and rush to save him as the Vordak creeps closer. Suddenly, the Kron Rider reappears, gliding low across the deck before hovering over the bow. A length of thin black rope dangles from its saddle, and hurriedly, the Vordak threads it through the corners of the net. You race up the steps, shouting, For Summerland! and launch your attack. The Vordak turns to face you, its skeletal features frozen in a mask of terror. An instant later, your weapon shears its bony neck and sends its skull-like head spinning down into the Denarg. A ghastly cry pierces your ears, but it is not a shriek of pain or despair. It is a malicious caw of triumph. The Kron beats its massive wings, and the downdraft forces you to your knees as the creature climbs higher into the darkening sky. You stare aghast as the rope closes the net around Pido and lifts him off the deck. Instinctively, you leap upwards, your hands outstretched to grab the barbed net, but it is too late. The Kron turns in midair and flies off to the north with Pido, wounded and helpless, swinging like a netted fish below its leathery black belly. No! They got Pido! My Pido is in another castle! Damn, they stole my buddy. My homie. That's not good. I wonder if I can get to go rescue him in the next book. So they stole Pido. This is just like when I lost my towel. This is like when I lost my weighted companion cube in Portal. Okay, goodbye Pido. Well, I've got good news and bad news, Pido. The bad news is... You got captured by the forces of pure evil and undoubtedly have a horrible fate ahead of you. The good news is I won the book because I get to turn to 350, which is the final section. Anger and frustration well up inside you as helplessly you watch the Kron and your captured companion disappear beyond the horizon. Gradually, your anger gives way to sadness as you ponder his fate and wonder if he will ever survive this cruel abduction. Signs point to no. You pray for his safety, calling on the spirits of your ancestors to watch over and protect him, and, as if in answer to your prayer, you feel a sudden calm engulf your senses. The power of the Lore Stone, transfused into your being the instant it appeared in your hands, has greatly increased your intellect and awareness. With confidence, you know that Pido will survive his ordeal, and that one day you will meet and fight again side by side. That's it? I'm just writing him off with, 
I'm sure he'll be fine. One day we'll meet again. I'm not gonna go after him to try to- I have a fucking sky ship. Can't I just like go out? I'm just like, I could go rescue him, but I feel a sudden calm. I'm sure he'll be okay. One day we will meet again. All the intervening time when he's gonna be like tortured and mutilated by the forces of evil. Eh, whatever. I have a certain confidence and calm about this. It's okay, Pido. Don't worry. I'm, I'm out, though. I gotta bounce. The return voyage to Desi is a swift but lonely journey. The Star Guider ensures that the Levitron stays on course for Elzion. And as you cross the canal which encircles the city, a pilot skyship arrives to escort you down. During the voyage, you have discovered how to control the Levitron. And now, as slowly you approach the landing platform of the Tower of Truth, you disengage the Star Guider and make a faultless landing. Lord Ramoa and the High Council have gathered to greet your return, and upon hearing of your successful quest, their hopes for the future are renewed in spite of the sad news of Lord Pido's capture by Agents of the Dark Ones. Nobody gives a fuck about Pido. They're like, yeah, that sucks. But hey, let's throw a party for you succeeding, huh? Also, I like how Lone Wolf just learns how to fly a magical sky ship on the journey and make a faultless landing. This is like that time when, on his, like, 12-day boat trip to Vasagonia, he perfectly learned the whole Vasagonian language. Dude, dude learns fast. He's a fast learner. The High Council listens avidly as you recall your treacherous journey through Telestria, the perilous trek across the, the Denarg, and the wondrous discovery of their lost temple. When finally you have completed your account, they applaud and pay tribute to your courage and daring, their faces beaming with pride. But, despite their joyous greeting, you sense that something is wrong. They seem distant, as if their minds were preoccupied with the solving of a difficult and perplexing problem. Don't you know, Kai actually translates into OP Haxor? Basically, yeah. Well, in this world, in this setting, the Kylords are essentially Jedi. They're like the Jedi Knights, and of course, Lone Wolf is the last one, because, you know, you always gotta be the last of something that makes you cool. You ask Lord Ramoa if all is well, and he replies, You have grown in perception, Lone Wolf. Many things have occurred since last we spoke, and although your quest for the Lore Stone of Orido has succeeded, the peril of our age has grown ever more deadly. The Dark Lords now wage open war throughout Magnamund, and many lands have fallen before their Giac legions. Telestria has been overrun. So too have the Stormland nations. Summerland stands firm against the armies of Dark Lord Nag, but she has lost her southern province of Ruinon. This shocking news fills you with an urge to return to your homeland, yet to do so would defeat the Magna Chi quest. Oh no! Do I go to help my friends or do I stay here and complete my training with Yoda? I don't know which to do. Lord Ramoa bids you follow him to the chamber of the High Council. Set into the floor is a circular well, brimming with a silvery liquid metal. Ramoa kneels and touches the surface, and slowly a vision takes form within the shimmering depths of the pool. It is a fortified city surrounded by rolling hills. You look upon the city of Tahu, in the land of Anari, says Ramoa, his voice now solemn and composed. The law stone you must find next lies deep below its streets, in an ancient city that was built during the dawn of Magnamon. Everything's always ancient. They're never like, you need to go seek this and some shit that was built last week. The dawn, I mean, everything, everything's ancient that you gotta go to. It's ancient. The vision of Tahu heralds the start of a new and perilous episode in your quest for the Magna Kai. If you possess the bravery and courage of a true Kai Master, the challenge of Tahu awaits you in Book 9 of the Lone Wolf series entitled, The Cauldron of Fear. And that's the end of this one.
Enigma Soul says, if he wasn't the last one, they'd have to call him one of many wolves. And that's just not as catchy. Also takes up a lot of space on the cover, you know? One of many wolves. Just another wolf. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. If you possess the bravery and courage and you shell out the few books for the the few bucks for the next book, you can continue your journey. Expendable wolf. Yeah. So, another Pyrrhic victory. Now, this isn't nearly as sad as when we lost the towel, but we did lose a friend. I did get a sack of silver out of it, though, so, you know, take the good with the bad. But, um, Paido is lost, Lone Wolf has written him off with some sort of fucking hokey, mystical, oh, I'm sure we'll meet again thing. And next we have to go to Lake Tahoe. No, it's not Lake Tahoe, it's Tahoe. I live near Lake Tahoe. Maybe Pido knows where your towel is. Maybe they will meet again. When I meet Pido again, he will somehow have my towel with him. One can hope. One can only hope. Well, that's it for this book. Another one complete. Another one victorious. I died four times in this one, though, which is bad. That's a tie for my worst performance with book six, where I also died four times. So, that's going to bring us to the end of Lone Wolf Book 8, The Jungle of Horrors. Next time, we'll come back to Book 9, The Cauldron of Fear. Pretty exciting. It's going to do it for this one. Thank you for watching. This has been Josiah Plays Lone Wolf Book 8, The Jungle of Horrors.